So I'm just going to get started, although I know people are still coming into the room. So welcome, everyone. I'm Professor Thomas Mitchell uh, from Boston College Law School, where I founded the Initiative on Land, Housing, and Property Rights last year, and I serve as the director for the, um, the initiative. So it's so good to see all of you, or I know we have a contingent of folks from Texas. So as we would say, welcome to all y'all. You've come from uh, all over the United States, including 31 states and the District of Columbia. Um, just let me tell you a little bit about yourselves. You're academics and researchers from many disciplines, undergraduate and professional and graduate students from a diverse range of universities, including Ivy League, land grants, and HBCUs as a graduate of Howard Law School. Just got to say, you know. Elected officials from local and state level, policymakers from the local, state, and federal level, staff from leading heirs property organizations, older and more incipient or newer organizations, staff from local uh, and national phil uh, philanthropies, people who work in media and film, activists and artists, nonprofit staff and public interest lawyers, and more. I need to thank first a number of people and organizations. I want to first of all thank Boston College generally uh, and Boston College Law School more specifically for, among other things, providing the funding to make the initiative on land, housing, and property rights possible. So we're very grateful for that seed funding. The Institute for the Liberal Arts for providing funding to make this conference possible. Fran Miller from the Vermont Center for Agriculture and Food Law Systems, and Andrea Bob Stark from the National Consumer Law Center for each organizing one of our conference's panels. Staff and those affiliated with the Institute, or I'm sorry, the Initiative for Land, Housing, and Property Rights, including David Price, our Associate Director, Professor Lisa Alexander, the initiative's faculty director of housing and property rights programs, um, and Sam Gelly, our administrative assistant. And I'll add something in a second about Sam. Um, our communications and marketing team, specifically Nate Kenyon and Amanda Crowley, and Sam also worked hand in hand with them. I must say that um, I've put them under enormous stress. Sorry about that. I I know that Nate's been up till two and three in the morning regularly in the past uh, couple weeks because <laughs> of me. Um, but Nate, this too shall pass. Um, and I want to thank my family, Professor Lisa Alexander and my daughter Kira for kind of picking up the slack as I've been kind of working um, a lot to uh, put this conference together. So in terms of the conference, my kind of theory of the case was I wanted to have a conference on Ayers property that showed the view of the entire waterfront. Um, so today we're gonna take a little bit of a, a, a break for you guys, take a little bit, of, uh, we're gonna be a little bit easier today than tomorrow, but tomorrow, you know, I have everybody on a forced march. Um, and, and part of that is I know that there are some uh, organizations or agencies who are relatively new to heirs property, some of them who want to begin engaging in doing heirs property work. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, kind of show you as much as possible to not knowing what would be the point of entry for your particular organizations. What I think is great is um, if we had had a conference 25 years ago, I'd say 70% of the issues we have on the agenda would have not even made, would, folks wouldn't have known anything about them, right? Um, except for the people who were directly, perhaps most impacted. I wanna thank for our, the idea for our, and let me also thank a, a lot of folks that I've known for a long time when we just got started, so I'm looking at Robert Zabawa from Tuskegee University. We go back to what, 96? A long time, 
right? When I was, you know, you were younger and I was young. Um, but anyway, it's good seeing you, Robert. Um, and so the, um, um, we want to get started with our first panel, which is a, a panel of graduate students doing research in Ayers property from a number of different disciplines from a variety of different universities, University of Florida, University of Michigan, and Tuskegee. Um, and I want to thank the one of the panelists, Bill Lam, who actually contacted me a few months ago about the idea of having a graduate uh, student panel, which, um, which I thought was an, just an excellent and awesome idea. So I know that Nate's about to give me the hook. Nate, will you? No, I was doing good? All right. So I, I promised you I wouldn't run over. Um, so I think without um, kind of any further ado, um, I'm just going to turn it over. I think, are we taking a break until we start at 1.30? OK. Um, yeah, so we're going to have a little bit of a break, and we'll get the, that first uh, panel set up. Um, so let me just, since, uh, since I'm not quite running over, I mean, I have to just kind of share my perspective. 25 years ago when I got started, and Robert can validate this, the number of us who are doing heirs property work, you could have put us in a small conference room. There was um, a tiny number of rural sociologists, anthropologists, a tiny number of kind of folks who did like legal research. There were um, very few media articles addressing heirs' property issues, certainly nothing at the national level. If you saw them, they were all, you know, papers kind of at the county level, all in the, in the South. Um, and there was almost no interest among elected officials and policymakers to try to address the issue in any kind of systematic or systemic way, right? And to kind of go from the state of um, play 25 years ago, um, when you just, you know, if you talked about Ayers property, I had to kind of do the cliff note version and tell them you'd say that. And they're like, are you talking about air rights? Um, and, you know, it's still the majority of the population knows little about Ayers property, but I'm amazed now when I randomly, and it's wherever I am, like I'm traveling somewhere, and I get into a conversation, I start doing the old, you know, let me keep this real simple and the cliff notes. And folks said, no, no, I've heard of that. You know, you don't like you could skip the introduction. So I think that's incredible. And then the, just the kind of the stakeholders as reflected by the attendees at this conference, right? Um, you know, I thought when I started, my highest hope was to, by the very end of my career, when I took status as an emeritus professor and no longer had to teach, was kind of work with the network of people I'd worked with over the course of my career. And the big idea back then was, could we reform this law of partition in one state, like Southern state? And even then, that seemed like ridiculously ambitious. Right. Um, and I think to, you know, when you look at the composition of the folks who are attending this conference, and if I had told people a few, even a few years ago, oh, we're going to have this conference and there's going to be all these people from multiple federal agencies or uh, government sponsored en entities such as Freddie May, Fannie Mac, there's going to be a number of philanthropies. There's going to be academics and graduate students from multiple disciplines. There's going to be elected officials and policymakers. People would have been, you know, kind of recommending that maybe I need get some uh, attention for my mental health issues. So I, I just think it's just wonderful that we, um, it's just wonderful that, that we're here. So I'm going to stop now and then uh, get transitioned to our very first panel. Or is it afternoon? Should I say that? Okay, good afternoon. Um, can you hear me? Is everyone okay? Not great? How about now? Is that better? All right. Hi, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Tess Myrie, 
and um, I'll be moderating this session uh, for um, the graduate student panels. Uh, I am currently a uh, PhD student uh, in at the University of Georgia, the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural uh, Resources, and uh, my area of study is um, remote sensing uh, and precision forestry. Um, I also hold a Master's of Business Administration and Finance, and I have a Master's of Forestry also from University or Yale University. Um, so what we're going to do here, more or less, is just I'm going to introduce uh, each of the panelists, um, and then they will come to the podium, and then they will deliver just a bit on what their actual research is going to be about. I think their manuscript will be made available at some point, if not already. And um, just to get a sense of what we are going to more or less um, go through and then take some questions and answers uh, after that. So first up, we're going to uh, talk, uh, have uh, Belay Alem come up. He is a PhD uh, student in our candidate in, an, in anthropology at the University of Florida. And um, he will be discussing, one second. Uh, just scarce property and infrastructure. Is that correct? All right. So, Bilal Alam. Yep. Or do you want to? Do you want to? Just okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bilal. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Balai Alam. I'm a PhD student at the University of Florida in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, by training, uh, I'm Ethiopian by origin. I did my undergrad in law school and master's in business and corporate law. Uh, I have also a little bit of training in business school. I did an undergrad in uh, major in management and minor in accounting. So these days, I'm doing a kind of legal anthropology. I'm blending anthropology and uh, law in a certain way. So my major project is on heirs property in general. So I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, complicated uh, circumstances of heirs property. Basically, I'm interested in understanding in the conditions, factors, and the process of uh, uh, property dispossession, heirs property dispossession among African-American communities. OK, uh, moving forward, uh, I'll be covering this thing. So I'll be brief, giving brief overview of heirs property. Uh, and then uh, I'm interested in sharing one of my ethnographic uh, case studies that I picked up from uh, Alachua County, Florida. And finally, uh, I will have a few like uh, concluding remarks as well as um, uh, policy directions or whatever we call it. So uh, yeah, uh, Boston College basically is uh, you know where the major professor who is like diving uh, deep into his property resides, like Thomas Mitchell is whom we frequently refer the materials to understand what his property is. So I'll not define it beyond uh, what he uh, did. So it is a structure or a building that uh, passed through generations without will. And uh, uh, property is formed because of the inefficiency, lack of will basically. Uh, uh, lack of uh, estate planning among uh, family members. Uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes uh, I believe heirs property can be created in the uh, in the presence of will itself if the will is not properly uh, designed to capture the problems that my, the family members might encounter during probate process. So yeah, it's tenancy in common in general, meaning ten, uh, tenancy in common means uh, once the property is owned in the group or uh, within uh, multiple heirs, one if one of them passes away by any uh, in any case, then the, then it will continue, you know, being fractionated among family members. The substituted family members will continue uh, uh, getting their own shares, so the heirs will be multiplied over a period of time, over generation and generation. So that's it. So yeah, this is a family tree. You can see uh, this might be like 10,000 uh, world property. Then 
the two, there are two descendants, B and C, that will get uh, 5,000 each. It might not be net even, the probate, the probate process is expensive, they might incur something in the process. So uh, do you see like the next, the fourth generation will get like 1,250 out of 10,000. It keeps on going this way uh, to simplify it. So um, in general, in, uh, at the national level, uh, this is the data uh, uh, that, of course, uh, I have to cite uh, Dr. Thomas here as well. So nationally, heirs property, the African-American community was able to uh, acquire in millions uh, amount of heirs property, sorry, properties in general. And uh, most of it was lost in the next, like basically after 1920, uh, as per um, Dr. Thomas. Uh, Professor Thomas, uh, yeah, he made this analysis based on um, national census data. Uh, and in terms of, uh, uh, was it uh, home ownership as well, there is disparity between uh, African-American community and dominant racial group, as well as the national average uh, in general. So why do I do this research in Alachua County Zane? And, uh, the major thing is the uh, theory of Du Bois, who is a sociologist. Um, what he, he argues is that the experience of African-American uh, community is not the same. It varies from place to place. So understanding every experience based on the local context is really an uh, important thing. So one is that. Again, Alachua County in Florida is there are symptoms of racial terror, racial property terror, meaning uh, this can be exemplified by lynching records. There are lynching records. Uh, there is a Rose ma massacre, you know. The, the, there is a massacre of a certain community, and they completely displaced, were displaced from the uh, place where they were. And again, there, are, there is a prevalence of plantation sites in the area. All these things show that there is property, there was property terror in history. Uh, so then understanding the property experience, property ownership ex experiences, as well as uh, this session in general is really relevant in that space, in that specific space. So that's why I'm, uh, I'm interested in understanding that uh, context as property conduct. So in terms of these uh, proportions, uh, again, Alachua County, if you see this map, this is a map of Alachua County. Uh, and then this red dots show the size of its property concentration in the area. So uh, this all experiences of uh, air property owners as it at relates to, sorry, as it relates to their properties is really relevant. So uh, yeah, through different uh, ethnographic methods, I continued uh, digging the history, local histories of this community and air properties in general. Uh, uh, then uh, I have like, Based families. I have four major families that I'm building stories, but I have also conducted uh, nearly 60 interviews, deep interviews. Uh, some of the interviews are conducted 11 times. I do have a family member whom I interviewed 11 times because it flourishes over and over. Like the ideas that I get the first day and the last day is not the same because I keep like building trust and then people start uh, providing more and more information. That's one of the beauty of doing ethnographic research and engaging, uh, being a resident in the community. So uh, yeah, this is uh, the property, this uh, family uh, issue is, they, they acquired property, 40 acres of property um, after emancipation. And then uh, they, the family, the grandparents used it to have also another house in the town. And then almost this, both properties are in precarious situation at this time. And I wanted to share that story uh, uh, in quickly. And tax implications, family disagreement, insecurity of tenure, all those elements will be revealed in due course. So, so when I walk through uh, the first day of the interview, when I walk through the neighborhood of this tiny town named uh, Makanopi, I saw this division street uh, in the middle of the town. And then, oh, what's this about? What is it dividing? So it clearly showed me that it's a division of uh, white and black neighborhoods. 
uh, the neighborhoods. Uh, I asked this call, all questions, and finally, I found out the interview later in time even reveals that this is segregation, like the result of segregation. So uh, now I met the individual the first day of the meeting. Uh, the individual whom I was interviewing said, yes, my mother, my grandmother acquired this amount of, I said X because I didn't want to mention the individual, the, uh, the white supremacy, uh, she was clear. There was a KKK movement in the environment, in the area, and the individual is referring to that name. So there was 40 acres of uh, properties that my mom acquired at some point, and then we were pushed out of that space Finally, we are living here in a tiny, tiny town, uh, downtown of the, the tiny city. That's what he said. And then I asked, oh, is it true? Is this story true? That's, that's a kind of investigation I have to start. So I continued. The, the next thing I have to do is census record. I went through census record and found out that uh, in 1930, she really, with her husband, she really owned 40 acres of property. Uh, yet. Yeah. This is not allegation. He was true, and uh, I assume that this was assigned during, during Sherman Act, because not only her but also her brother was able to acquire own 40 acres of land. So there is no. It was not arbitrary to see this 40 acres of uh, numbers. This numbers, you know, uh, it indicated that yes, it was assigned. It was a promise of like the result of the promise of 40 acres and a mule uh, kind of thing. So what he said is we lost not only the property, we lost everything in this because of loss of this property, because, uh, because they were able to produce fresh food there. Uh, and they were not worried about what they eat, so kind of thing. So because of being pushed out of that. so. Uh, the idea is like this. They were intimidated to leave the space in the beginning, right? So the idea of intim intimidation to leave the space was, if you are not going out of this space, I am going to kill all of male family members. That's what, what the, the warning she got to, leave, uh, to go out of the space. So yeah, when they come here, they, they don't have anything to eat for the time being. And Many, uh, many of the family members were exposed to shortage of food, poverty, health issues, and so kind of thing. Then, in general, uh, wealth doesn't mean, the idea here is the wealth doesn't mean only the cash, the value they lost is $640,000, as we estimate today. That's the cash. But wealth is beyond that. They, are, they lost the, the, the possibility of being educated they lost the chance of staying healthy and so uh, other opportunities. So 40 acres of land is lost. We, now, I have to stop there because we don't have any, uh, any kind of record about that. It is erased story in general. We don't have any public record, anything. So, uh, back to this uh, urban property, how did she acquire that? That's the question. Uh, we don't have any title attached to the, uh, the, the any of the public documents about that even uh, urban property. What did she do? That's the, the family member, the surviving family member is saying that she was forced to trade in 40 acres of property with that one acre of urban property. That's what he gave me at the beginning of the interview. However, uh, that was not true. When we, we keep looking at the record of property appraisers office, I don't find any title attached to it, even in the name of the ancestor, meaning the deceased individual, the grandparent. So where is the title? Then it's cloudiness, not cloudiness. I would say, yeah, we were, I have to coin this term, dirty title, we anthropologists are good in um, coining terms. It's going like, beyond that, being cloudedness. It's dual cloudedness, we have to say cloudedness. So the first thing is then we have to start a new agenda of searching the title for his grandmother instead of for the heirs. So finally we, uh, we found that we went to the, I advised his family members to go in person to uh, look at the record. If it's not available online, 
they have to go in person and ask the judicial, sorry, the court clerk or anyone. So no one was able to find this property, sorry, this title. So I advised them also to go through this microfilm, very ancient document, and they were not able to find it. Who found it is uh, one of his family members, like remote family member related in uh, marriage, was there and she did like, kept like digging the microfilm uh, record and found it. So once we find these properties uh, was transferred to the individual, this woman, the grand uh, mom, and uh, in very conditional circumstance, meaning she has to pay on instrument basis, once like uh, $50 once, and then $10 every month until the all uh, the, uh, pr the price is paid up. And yes, it was purchased in 1949, then the property has to be transferred. The, tit the title deed has to be issued in 1949. This is the title deed we found at the end of the day. So now it's partially not clouded, meaning we found at least the title for the grandma. So this property still is tax delinquent and uh, many people in the neighborhood want to buy it. There is a fight in the neighborhood to purchase this property. Um, uh, his immediate neighbor always knocks the door, his door, uh, and asks him, oh, I know you, you are tax, going tax delinquent, then can I buy it? I am the one who can provide you, you the best price. If you go through tax sale process, then you are not gonna get uh, the good price kind of negotiation. Now they are in conflict, uh, and uh, he was not able to do that. There is insecurity on the side of the air, uh, encounter with neighbors, but at the end of the day, I found out that uh, this, this property, the tax certificate is owned by, um, uh, was purchased by a company located in New Jersey, which is very close here, right? The company is located in New Jersey. So we are looking, we are saying um, when this, so the Florida, uh, Statutory legislation limitation is two years. Once two years is over, then the company will take it or uh, will sell, uh, sorry, force tax sale. Um, so exactly, uh, this is a process of tax sale in Florida. Um, I, I designed this like uh, circular kind of stuff, the, the uh, diagrammatic take expression based on the statutory um, dictations. And at this stage, I say, yes, it was advertised. Uh, it was auctioned and outbid the tax certificate. And now the, the property is at the tax certificate redemption stage, meaning still he has a chance to uh, pay everything and get the property back. So yeah, that is uh, what I can share. Uh, in general, um, I would suggest very engaged. Okay, this is something going under the cover, right? Unless you go deep, uh, we go deep, uh, reside in the community and do uh, a very uh, different kind of scholarship. This is something that we will not understand. Their memories, uh, the property of some people is like where their grand, uh, their ancestors possibly might have been buried and kind of thing. So there are memories. Everything subjective, very subjective, it's beyond property. So sociological, anthropological kind of engaged research is very essential. Uh, macro, the, this engagement might be from macro and micro level, you know. The property at the macro level means at the community level or at the municipal level um, is given a different attention as we see, as we compared with how, say for example, the federal government, state level government considers that specific property. Um, so the engaged research will reveal a lot of, a lot of things. And in terms of legislation, that uh, Uniform Heirs Property Act has covered a lot about, a lot about uh, uh, problems of rural property. And uh, again, it also helps a lot for the larger urban properties. 
But for tiny properties like this, still we need uh, different different attention uh, engagement. And I also suggest holistic engagement. People, whenever we go to the workshops or anywhere, people talk about probating, getting uh, uh, properties probated. That's one solution. But uh, probate will not, uh, uh, engagement from legal side will not resolve all of the problems that uh, I tried to, do, to mention. So if we probate, get it probated, then still issues, some issues will continue. What's important is still raising the wealth gap of the community, income uh, base of the community, and so on. So legal access for many uh, rural land, say for example, property, uh, people are losing their properties because they are not able to get loan that helps them to cultivate the property, right? So in that case, property is not solution. What's the solution is like loan, financial access, aid, and uh, so kind of thing. Uh, trust is important. Some resources are not still not consumed uh, by the community members because they don't trust it. You know, oh, you are here providing this, this uh, resources not to help us, but to get access to our property kind of thing. So building a trust for any kind of the uh, resource that we want to provide is still important thing. If time is going, someone can stop me by this. <laughs> uh, Oh, yeah, good. So um, a kind of trust, uh, building trust is a very important thing. That's still anthropological, sociological, and so um, uh, related thing. Uh, and what I see is there is also clear, clear uh, discrepancy between the Western way of understanding property ownership, this hierarchy of uh, property, and how really as property owners want to maintain it, right? So there is like a distance between the social dimension of property inheritance, I'm dealing with inheritance, and as well as how the law really assumes property to be transferred from uh, generation to generation horizontally and vertically uh, or in any way. So it's quite important um, to fix a balance between these discrepancies, uh, the interest of the state and the interest of the community, specifically African-American community. Uh, the discrepancy comes from this. One, uh, the state focuses on extractable element of the property, meaning increasing the tax base. Extraction is related to taxation, revenue generation and kind of thing. Um, uh, from the workshops organized by the municipalities or the gov any government agencies, I saw that government is really interested in, you know, increasing the value of that property specific area through uh, transferring the property, even at the cheaper price to the real estate developer, and then to gain it back through taxation, like real estate, uh, real property taxation or corporate taxation or any kind of thing. Whereas the community members want to keep it, say for example, if there are trees, uh, uh, sheds, anything, uh, they want to make use of that. And uh, at the same time, uh, in some cases, even they don't want to transfer it in, the, uh, in, in a formal way. Uh, there are various reasons I mentioned during uh, my interview. So one of the reasons is, say for example, uh, that's a way of protecting loss of the property but from the, their perspective. What does it mean? If I get, uh, provide like very clean will to the community members, sorry, the fam family members, and then they, they are going to sell it. If I leave it as it is, then uh, they will keep it and pass through generation this in this way. That's like cultural way of uh, property transfer. Another thing is, another reason they want to keep it as it is, is uh, when the property is very insignificant, and then the family members are uh, many in number. Okay, in that case, they don't want to be uh, bad for some family members and good for some other family members. They want to avoid possible conflicts in the family. Um, that's uh, that's one of the reasons. So in general, uh, we see we see uh, discrepancies. Uh, between 
how the state perceives the form of the Western uh, based uh, law, property law perceives the property as property and how say themselves uh, uh, understand uh, and maintain as property. So yeah, this is a few, uh, some of the things that I can share. And uh, if there, yeah, yeah uh, I hope we will address in the form of uh, Q and A. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I think we're going to just go to questions at the end. Um, but uh, next up, um, we have Uju uh, Ivijor, and um, she will be discussing um, race and place. That's a very simplified version of it. But she will. Um, she's a. Uh, she is a. PhD student in the Integrative uh, Public Policy and Development Program at uh, Tuskegee uh, University. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. My name is Obiano Jui Gebor. I'm a PhD student in the Integrative Public Policy and Development Program at Tuskegee University. And I'm really excited to be presenting this part of my research because I don't think there's any better gathering to be presenting this since we're gathered for S Property and the Racial Wealth, Wealth Gap Conference. My presentation is going to be on the impact of race, region, and S property in the rural South. I'm going to just run through the introduction, objectives, literature, justification, all through to the acknowledgments. Like Bila had defined earlier, S properties, real property, passed down through generation after the original landowner has passed on without the prohibited will. And because it is an unstable form of land ownership, the deed of the land is registered in the name of the original landowner. And all the heirs own this as tenants in common, having undivided fractional interest. And because of this, it's usually, um, there's usually involuntary land loss due to conflicting and competing development plans and non-payment of taxes. Research has shown that S property is considered one of the leading causes of African-American land loss. Um, between 1910 and 2017, there's been almost 80% record of land loss among African-Americans, both in Alabama and the US. 
So the objective of my research is to examine the impact of race and region on S property ownership by looking at the difference in the social demographics, the nomenclature in terms of how these various counties term S property. Also looking at the asset value of the land based on the tenure status and the value of improvement to land based on the various regions that I'll be looking at. So nationally, the exact amount of S property remains unclear. However, some research have estimated that in the Black Belt South alone, S property accounts for almost 1.6 million acres worth of land, worth $6.6 .6 billion in the Black Belt South alone. And over time, heirs to one parcel can number in hundreds and they may not know each other or work on the land. S property, like you mentioned earlier, is found throughout the United States. However, is usually higher in places with high poverty and high minority population. Also, some research show that the issue of S property is pervasive among ethnic and racial minorities with people having low income and lower wealth. So after looking at S property nationally and regionally, in terms of looking at S property from local perspective, researchers on S property have looked at wills and estate planning, the impact of S property on agriculture and how it affects farming and the food system in general, as well as community development. So in justifying the point of my research, so previous researchers have examined S property among different ethnic and racial groups from different region. However, very little has been done in examining the differences between these racial and ethnic groups within the same state or the same region. Many S property research have focused on land loss among the Southern or the rural um, African-Americans. But my paper is gonna analyze S property in three regions, all within the same state, which is Alabama. So I'm gonna be looking at the Black Belt, the Tennessee Valley, and the Wiregrass. So if we look up on the map, the red part of the map is the Tennessee Valley, which is located in the north of Alabama. The green, highlighted green part of the map is the Black Belt counties, and then the yellow part is the Wiregrass. So um, these counties were categorized based on the population density of African-Americans. So the Black Belt County, the target region that I focused on for this paper is Macon County, so which is highlighted in brown. So Macon County, Macon County is one of the 10 Black Belt counties having over 15% African-American population. Macon County, which is the target county has the highest amount of African-American population in the entire state, almost 80%. And then in the Tennessee Valley, the target county is the one in blue, is Winston County. Again, I use the population to categorize these counties according to regions. So all the counties in the Tennessee Valley have less than 5% African-American population. Winston County is the least in the entire state. It has 1.2% African-American population. And then in the Wiregrass counties, that's the yellow portion, the red county is Henry County, is the target county. So for this situation, I highlighted Henry County because it has the state, it's closest to the state average. The state average of African-American population in Alabama is 25.8%, and Henry County has 25.1% African-American population. So the method. So I sourced the data for this research using each of the county's GIS maps, and then use the search term of errors but I also recognize that so many counties um, identify S property using different terms. Some of them address S property as at all. Some of them address S property as a state and others address S property as disease. So I also took that into cognizance and also used the search term to identify 
all possible or potential S property um, across all the various counties in the various regions. I also did a statistical analysis using the chi square and T test to test my hypothesis as well as check for the group means. And then what did we find? So this table, it's uh, analysis of social demographic data. So it basically shows that, shows the social demographic data of the three counties in relation to the states and the nation. Even though the counties, the target counties are relatively small counties, they are similar in population, um, in per capita income, and in land area. However, they are also different in terms of racial composition, the poverty rate, and the quality of life ranking done by the state. And then this second table here also identifies all S property as well as potential S property. So if we look at it closely, we'll notice that Macon County has the highest number of S property. Remember that uh, Macon County is located in the Black Belt County, and it has the highest number of S property in total, which is 1,676. Winston County, which is in the Tennessee Valley, which is the predominantly white county, has 774 S property, while Henry County, again, which, which has a um, combination of um, the African Americans and the white population, has 1,489 S property in total. And I also like us to notice that in this table, Henry and Winston County do not identify S property using the term deceased. And they, 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 to a significant degree, they use estates to identify S property. However, Macon County, on the other hand, uses, to a high degree, uses heirs to identify most of the heirs property. And after running, this, running the test, we found that there was actually a significant difference between the various counties. Now into the fun part. So <laughs> I hope it's fun for everyone. <laughs> so yeah, so this table shows the difference in the land, the acreage of the three, the, the acreage of all the parcels in all three counties. Shows the difference in the land value the improvement value, as well as the total value. So if you look at the top of the um, table, it, like I mentioned earlier, we see that there's a high incidence of S property in Macon County versus the other two counties. But when we look at the acreage, we see that there's a significant higher amount of, S, of parcels in Henry County versus Macon County and Winston County. Again, just to refresh our memory, Henry County is the county in the, in the Wiregrass, which it has a good combination of African-Americans and whites, while Winston County has less than 5% African-Americans, and then Macon County has over 50% African-American, but in this case, it has almost 90% African-American population. So moving on. So um, look, we, I used an ANOVA test to see if there's significance between the three counties and it is test to see if there's a significance individually between all the various counties. And we find that in the, for the mean acres across board, there was significance amongst all the counties, but comparing them individually, there was a higher significance only in Henry County while com comparing it to Winston and Macon County. Then moving over to the land value, Across board again, there was significance for all the counties. And looking, comparing them individually, I also found the significance comparing all the counties individually. Again, moving to the improvement value, we see that um, Henry County again has a much higher improvement value to the land while comparing it to Winston and Macon. And when testing them, Doing the ANOVA test, we found that they were significant all round, 
comparing them individually again, we found that they were all significant. But when we moved down to the total value, there was a less, they were significant with the ANOVA test all round, but there was less significance with making county when, done it, when compared individually. So now, bearing in mind that S property is a complex or has a complex characteristics to it, you would, the expectation is that the land value is usually higher, much higher than the improvement value. And when you look at it all around, there is a, make, it's reflected both in making County and in, and in um, Winston County. However, it's interesting to see that Henry County on the, the it's not, ref, it's, there's a much higher, there's a, the land value is higher in um, Winst, Hen, Hen, in Henry County, there's a much higher improvement in making County and in Henry County. However, that is not reflected in Winston County. And the assumption is, or the question is, why? What is standing out? There's only one factor, which is the racial composition. So this led me to the summary or the conclusion that there's a lack of uniformity regarding S property nomenclature across various counties. And S property parcels in the three counties, the three counties are significant. Similarly, there's a lot of acres tied to S property ranging from over 7,000 acres to over 32,000 acres. The land value is significant from over $25 million to over $76 million. And the land was the basis for the improvement ranging from $27 million to over $56 million. So in conclusion, the nomenclature issues needs to be addressed to further eliminate the heirs property issues and significant air property issues are not confined to African-American landowners in the rural South in terms of parcel number and the value of land and improvements. Communities with significant air property are potentially losing benefits of development, including taxes. And more studies need to be done in terms of addressing communities with high number of air property ownership. So these are my references. And I'd like to also acknowledge my um, faculty advisor and the grants that have supported me, the USDA Capacity Building Grants, the Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers Policy Center, as well as the ERS. Thank you. Okay. Um, so our last panelist, um, all good. All right. So our last panelist is uh, Jasmine Symington, and uh, she's a joint doctoral candidate in sociology and public policy at the University of Michigan, and she's going to be discussing vacancy. Thank you, Tess. Thank you to the organizers of the conference and to all of you all for joining us in the audience. I'm really excited to follow these two um, amazing presentations. Uh, so I'm gonna skip some of the introduction and jump right into my analysis. Um, but today I'm gonna be pre presenting a chapter of my dissertation, which is broadly about heirs property in Charleston, South Carolina. And today I'm gonna talk about the relationship between heirs property vacancy and the racial wealth gap. So what we learned from Bile and Uju is that there are challenges with heirs property owners exercising their property rights and reaping the full benefits of home ownership. This makes the question of wealth building for heirs quite tenuous and um, because research shows that this ownership arrangement is concentrated in non-white populations, although not exclusively as we just learned, um, it makes the question of heirs property important for considering the racial wealth gap. Often when we think about wealth, we jump immediately to home equity and property values, um, but my paper is going to intervene sort of just before that and ask about can heirs property owners even build on their land? 
Um, so the main question I'm going to be exploring today is to what extent does heirs property shape the likelihood, sorry, heirs property status shape the likelihood that a parcel is vacant? And when I say vacant, um, I mean, is there a home on the land or not? Uh, which is different from studies that use vacancy to proxy for unoccupied ownership. Um, so another way to think about this question is, is there a home on the land or not? And how much of that is because of the property being owned in heirs property status? Um, and I think this is an important question for wealth building because home ownership is the largest source of wealth for most households outside of the 1% um, and especially black households. So knowing whether people have been able to convert their land ownership into home ownership, I think is a critical empirical exploration for questions around heirs property and wealth building. So just to quickly summarize some of the prior empirical investigations, uh, in a study focused on Macon County, Alabama, the scholars found that 43% of heirs property had structural improvements, and these improvements were more common in incorporated areas, and we just learned a little bit more about that um, in the prior presentation. A second study on heirs property in Macon County estimated the total improved value at $375,000, and that was only 10% of the total improved value on properties with clear title. Um, at the same time, studies of housing vacancy uh, have considered have not considered whether ownership status is a predictor of that. So in one of the most commonly cited studies on vacancy, uh, the author finds that local housing market conditions, gentrification, and physical neglect are key predictors of vacancy, but they don't actually look at how those properties, the legal ownership status of those properties. So I'm sort of building from these prior studies to explore the building of a home specifically. So not just, um, not broad improvements, not improvements broadly, but specifically, is there a home? Um, and then I'm looking at a different uh, housing market context, which I'll tell you a little bit about more in a second. So by understanding how ownership status shapes vacancy, I'm hopefully, hopefully offering new insights into the challenges of literal wealth building for heirs property owners. Um, and so this is gonna be a pretty empirically <laughs> heavy paper, but um, I hope that this empirical evidence will kind of support the longstanding legal theories uh, from legal historians and practitioners and testimonies from current heirs property owners. So I'm gonna walk you through the main hypotheses of this paper. So first, because of the coordination issues that we heard about earlier and challenges obtaining construction loans due to clouded title, my first hypothesis is that if we compare heirs properties to other properties with clear title, that heirs properties will have higher rates of vacancy. And that's probably the most intuitive part of this. Um, second, as previous research has shown that heirs property is concentrated in majority non-white areas, I hypothesize that heirs property parcels in neighborhoods with a larger concentration of black residents will have larger barriers to building, and that's gonna result in higher vacancy rates for, the, for parcels in those neighborhoods. Um, thirdly, I'm also interested, not just in comparing heirs properties to other kinds of parcels, but understanding the variation among heirs property parcels. So um, there are a lot of characteristics within the group of heirs property owners that we don't typically study, but that might impact their vacancy rates. So what you'll see me display today is parcel size and land market value, um, but I think there's a lot more to think through there in the future. Um, so what is my data? What is my analytical approach? Um, my analytic sample includes 2,624 residential parcels in Charleston County. So I'm not exploring agricultural parcels here. Um, I have 2019 data from Zillow's property assessment database, and then neighborhood characteristics come from the 2019 American Community Survey five-year estimates at the block group level. Um, because my um, outcome of interest is a binary indicator, it's a yes, no, do you have a structure or not? I'm not fitting a linear regression. I am going to use a non-hierarchical, or sorry, a hierarchical logistic regression. I won't go into the details there, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer those afterwards. Um, and because there is clustering at the neighborhood level, the multi-level 
logistic regression is the most appropriate fit there. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my variables, and if you have questions about these, I can answer them later, but it is, it's going to feel like I'm running quickly through this. So the outcome of interest is, is there a home or not? And that's coming from a variable in Zillow. Um, that database includes a count of what they call main buildings. And so that could be a single family residence or it could be a mobile home, but it's not going to include something like a shed. The primary explanatory variable is a yes, no variable denoting whether the par parcel is heirs property, family trust or life estate. Um, I can talk more about defining this variable later, but um, the main thing I would love feedback on is if you think these are the right comparison groups, I'm happy to have insight, get insight from you all on that piece. Um, I think they're the right comparison groups because family trusts are similarly collectively owned but have clear title, and the life estate is the ownership arrangement that some heirs' properties convert to when they clear title. Um, but there are lots of comparison groups that could be possible, and if you have thoughts, please let me know. Um, so I'm controlling for property characteristics, as I mentioned, parcel size, market value, and then neighborhood characteristics, which include population density, the median property value in that block group, the local vacancy and home ownership rates, the share of black residents, the age of those residents, um, the age of the housing structure, so, whether, so the share of homes built before 1960. Um, and I throw all of this into a statistical model. And instead of presenting the dense tables, I will spare you all that. I am just gonna show you some figures from the predicted probabilities, which is basically like, what's the likelihood that this parcel is vacant given this set of property and neighborhood characteristics? So first, let me just tell you about the descriptives. So what I think is the two key findings here, they're sort of outlined in red. You can already see that the share of heirs properties with a home on the land is just 37% whereas it's 78 and 80% for homes held by a family trust or a life estate. So already with hypothesis one, we're thinking, yes, the vacancy rates as I use vacancy are lower for heirs property owners. Second, if we look down at the second red column, we see that um, heirs properties are located in neighborhoods with higher shares of black residents, 42% compared to 17 and 31% for properties held as a family trust or as a life estate. Um, so let me walk you through this figure. So here I'm sort of asking, across different kinds of neighborhood demographics, what's the likelihood that an heir's property is vacant compared to a family trust? And so heir's property is on, the, on your right side of your screen and the family trust is on the left. Um, and the way to read this is the x-axis is the, sh the share of black residents in a neighborhood. And so in neighborhoods with the smallest share of black residents, the probability of having a home on the land for heirs property is 48%. Um, but in neighborhoods with the largest share of black residents, it declines to 38%. And if we look at the family trust properties, the probability of having a home on the land in neighborhoods with the smallest share of black residents is 67%, but it goes down to 57% as the share of black residences increase. Um, so now we can look at the same kind of comparison, but for life estates rather than family trusts. Um, so here what we see is the probability of having a home on the land for a life estate is 76% in the smallest, in the neighborhoods with the smallest share of black residents, and Sorry, it's flipped. The life estate is now on the right instead of heirs' property. Um, but in neighborhoods with the largest share of Black residents, it goes down to 66%. So if we look at both family trusts and life estates, the probability, and, and heirs' property, the probability of a home being on the land decreases as the share of Black residents increases. But for heirs' properties, they follow that same trend, but the probabilities are always much lower. Um, I'm going to skip the next two slides, but these are basically showing you heterogeneity amongst heirs properties. So I'll just talk about my key takeaways. Um, 
what do these results reveal? First, heirs' properties are less likely to have a home on the land than other properties owned collectively but with clear title. Some of these differences are due not to heirs' property status, but to uh, other property characteristics, parcel size, land market value, and other, and some of this is coming from the neighborhoods that they're in, so not so much the heirs' property status. The, but heirs' property status is a significant predictor in these models. So these are descriptive, not causal results, um, but I still think, think they offer pretty strong empirical evidence for the claim that clearing title is gonna change, materially change people's housing outcomes because we see the ownership groups with clear title more likely to have a home on the land. Um, a couple of limitations and future directions before I wrap up. Um, this is a single site study. I fell into the trap Professor Mitchell mentioned in the beginning. <laughs> so I think that exploring this and other kinds of housing market context, Charleston is a pretty strong housing market. What does this look like in a weak housing market? I think are important avenues for uh, future research. Um, and then this data set is only at the parcel level. I don't have data on the actual owners and that obviously might shape whether a home is bu being built, but I can't capture that in this analysis. Um, and then third, I think what is most exciting about this paper to me is that I'm able to offer evidence about what predictors among heirs' properties are shaping their housing outcomes. So we tend to quickly want to compare heirs' properties to other groups, but I think we can actually look within that group and figure out what are the um, key property and neighborhood characteristics that are causing different rates of vacancy. Perfect timing. <laughs> Okay, um, you guys heard from three very, very interesting panelists, um, and uh, you know we're doing a great, a great deal of uh, research, and um, I'm just impressed at all of the information that was um, presented here today. And uh, yep, um, so I'm gonna, yeah. So um, again, uh, these are our panelists, um, and uh, if you have any questions um, uh, as we uh, kind of consider, you know, my folks looking for questions. Okay, so if you see these folks. As they move around, please ask questions. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll kind of make that uh, a general thing here. And for um, again, thank them uh, and with some applause. And we uh, we really had a good time. Thank you guys for for coming. All right, I think we're going to get started with the Q and A for the grad panel. If you can please try and keep your question to under thirty seconds, we would really appreciate it. Would anyone like to start? Yes, in the back. Here's the mic. Here's the mic. There, 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 there's a mic coming to you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Um, in the first presentation, there was some commentary about there is ways that cultural preferences and property transfer may come to play in heirs property. Can someone expand on that? Okay, uh, yes, exactly. There is uh, the interplay of the cultural aspect of uh, property inheritance transfer and the formal way of uh, property transfer. So yeah, as I, it might not be clear, but I was trying to mention how the cultural aspect of property transferring is playing out in this Western-based community. Um, so there is their own way of like transferring the property uh, in the community. And that is not really uh, uh, in the expectation of the state, in the, in the expectation of the Western-based property transfer. So say for example, leaving the property, intending to leave the property in the family is the cultural, social by itself, right? That's something I wanted to touch on. Thank you. I have a somewhat similar comment or question about the second and third papers, which are you know have some similarities in that you're looking at you know uh, outcomes 
uh, for actual transactions or, or values uh, or uh, whether it's a development or not. And in, in both cases, I think there are ways you could uh, get some other covariates. For example, the different counties in the uh, second paper uh, in Alabama, I think. Uh, what's the nearest big city? How far is it? And, uh, you know, in the, in the third paper, you know, some other measures, in addition to like distance to some central business district or other thing that comes out of urban economics, uh, I think the third paper had uh, population density, but there's some other proxies you could maybe use such as how many building permits per capita or per acre in, in a given uh, county or area, you know, so that you're kind of, uh, I, I think of it as from the farmland perspective, you farm three things, you farm food, uh, government subsidies and subdivisions. And in, you know, the latter you could uh, come up with some measures in, in I think the latter two papers, thanks. That's really helpful feedback. I actually just got data on permits at the parcel level. And I think you're suggesting that I aggregate them to the block group level. Okay, yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for the presentations. They were really fantastic. Um, the third one, I was kind of intrigued by this idea of like you have this binary of um, th that binary of vacant and you know properties with, that had homes on them. But it, it you know that plays out so differently in all these different urban contexts. And you know I, I practice primarily in New York City, which is we have no vacant properties at all. Period. But we have tons of heirs property uh, properties, and it pops up all the time. Versus, I imagine a city like Detroit has a ton of vacant properties, a ton of heirs properties, and then you know your your sampling, which was in South Carolina, is probably somewhere in the middle. But it, it also made me wonder, like I don't know if you're comparing all these different urban contexts when you're when you're doing that analysis, but also this, um, like what is like in, in New York City, like we don't have any vacant properties, and in, in, in Detroit, there's probably a ton of vacant properties with homes that are abandoned or unlivable and are probably being removed. Like, how do you work all that into your analysis or is that even part of it? I wonder. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think the way, it's not in this analysis that I showed. Um, I think the best I can capture urbanicity is with population density. Um, but I think for reasons that the prior question got, it's not a perfect proxy. It That is kind of why I would like to, one, replicate the study in a housing market like Detroit. Um, but I actually think there might just be different outcomes to understand in an urban context. Maybe the question of vacancy isn't relevant, but there are other outcomes related to coordination or state rejection of aid that would just be more relevant for the urban context. I really enjoyed all the oops, sorry enjoyed all the presentations and Jasmine this is another question for you I'm just really fascinated by your research and look forward to seeing the final work product but just have a question about your comparison of heirs properties with the life estate and family trust properties and and why or maybe you're still considering then comparing that to a broader universe of properties so just for example comparing it to all single family properties in the city I think would be really um, interesting to look at. And I think in part because like, especially family trust properties, we know that's already gonna skew towards um, higher um, income families who can afford attorney to put a property into a trust. Yeah, this, I am still working through the right comparison group and I have run it basically heirs property versus everybody else. And um, I, people seem to sometimes not like that comparison because those groups are also so different. I'm sort of collapsing a ton of other ownership groups. Um, I think in the final version of the paper, I will include that fourth heirs property versus everyone else. It's the same trend, just to a different magnitude. Um, so just to say, yes, <laughs> I understand the frustration and I think I'll present all of the comparisons and, and see what matters for 
which audience yeah just a couple of things um so one i have a question for uju in terms of when you compared it was macon county with 90 percent african-american to what was it the wire grass winston county in the tennessee valley which has 1.2 percent african-american yeah. and um henry county in the wire grass which was like commiserate with the state average yeah. it just seemed like there were some real similarities between macon county and the one in the wire grass the Harry even county. though it had um you know i mean it wasn't um like the tennessee valley but it had you know relatively equal numbers of black and white um but it seemed like a lot of the kind of outcomes were similar so just kind of interested to hear what if you could shed some light on that the other thing i just want to do is anybody who's asking a question please identify your name and your institutional affiliation because there's like awesome people in this room so the last heather way was a uh, law professor at university of texas and who's done amazing heirs property work in texas and outside of texas identified herself before that we had stephen malpezzi no it was no actually scott kohanoski from New York, who's a leading um, lawyer in New York, who's done a ton of reform. Um, and then there was Steve Malpezzi, who's a former chair of the University of Wisconsin Business School's um, real estate and urban economics department. I'm, so I'm just giving you a s small snapshot. I don't know who the first person was, but I'm trying to give you a flavor of how awesome the people are in the room. So if you can just identify yourselves going forward on questions. Okay, so um, I also noticed the trend and the similarities between the two, um, the various counties, but um, the theory I'm throwing out is the predominant factor there or the distinct factor there is the racial thing, and we're trying to find out why that is. Because in terms of the population, the, pop the pop population poverty rate is about the same, per capita income is about the same, and it's almost commensurate with the national and the state level. So the only distinct difference there is the risk. So we're trying to find out why that is. And also interesting, if you if you noticed in one of those slides, it's also not Henry County has a much higher, Winston County had a much higher improvement value, which is unusual with S property because the expectation is that land value is usually higher than improvement value. But Winston County is different in that situation. And that's the question we're trying to find out why. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess I have a question for uh, the two ladies. I'm sorry I didn't get to see all of the, uh, the other, the first pres presentation. But um, I guess for, my name's Stratton Munson. I'm actually work at NASA down at Johnson Space Center in Houston. But I'm kind of living, I'm not a theoretical, I'm, I'm living this partition suit. And the one thing I wanted to see if you all had was did you consider any kind of government institutional bias? For example, like the USDA wouldn't make uh, agricultural loans to black or women for a long time and you know, you can't really buy out a farm or a ranch or even maybe uh, a residential community in an urban environment uh, if you don't have loans. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I can uh, go first. Um, I think uh, in the way my data is constructed, um, I'm not actually able to capture the mechanism of governmental bias, but I do think that that really motivates my question of can heirs build? I would argue that the inability for people with a particular property right to exercise it is governmental bias because <laughs> property rights are state constructed. So I think that uh, to the extent that they're not able to build because their loan is rejected, um, I think that's true. I just can't capture it in the data that I have. And in terms of my own data, um, all of my data was sourced from the various counties, GIS, which is an open source, open access for everyone. So the only thing I did differently was that I sifted this data and took away 
um, maybe commercially owned properties, like all the properties that had like LLCs or maybe I saw a parcel in, I think Winston that had like a huge um, acre of land belonging to Walmart. So that was obviously taking out. But in terms of like government buyers, my data cannot really answer that question at this time. It's just like blind picking out the data based on what is available to the public. Uh, just in terms of my research, I basically deal with um, local labor, very specific humanities uh, element. And then in terms of the government versus the individual interactions, I see, yeah. So the thing is, it, it, it originates from the law itself sometimes, uh, the interest to develop and the interest to maintain. And th in that gap, Yes, they say, for example, properties are easily transferred from once they come into the hands of the government, then they get transferred to the individual developers. And in that, in that process, like the legislation looks like a little bit biased, uh, meaning it's easier for the real estate developers and the, the government, and then a little bit heavier to the individuals. So I am picking the uh, cases here and there to understand the interactions kind of thing. So I'm not the kind of, I'm not doing any sampling to be, to avoid bias or, or kind of thing. I'm hunting case, individual family case. Thank you. This will be our last question. Yeah, I guess this is a, this is a question for the entire uh, panel, but maybe particularly for, um, Uju and uh, Belay, you know, and here I'm making a couple of assumptions. So the whole idea of regularizing or formalizing title or or, or land ownership is has is it's, um has a strong kind of um I guess presence or like uh, influence say in the global south, right? So uh, you know, clearing title or formalizing title as one way to uh, get at or diminish persistent poverty and build wealth. So that's sort of a model that we see that, you know, there's a lot of influence in, I guess, uh, applications of that or, or initiatives associated with that in the global South. And I see that as being sort of analogous to what most folks here are trying to do with Ayers property. Do you guys have any comments on, you know, those kinds of initiatives in the global south and how effective they may be in achieving some of those goals. Okay. And um, compare and tell us, you know, if it if it'll work here. <laughs> okay. Um I think one of the most effective um initiatives towards achieving clearing title or cleaning up the title would be um I think um we're working in collaboration with a couple of people in terms of um, doing workshops and making people actually aware of the excellence and how bad this can be or the amount of loss that you know, can exist due to S property ownership. So the first step is actually educating people or informing people on the extent or even making them aware that this is existent within their families because some are even unaware or even if they are, they are unaware of the extent or even how many people could be involved in S property ownership. So that's one active step towards um, addressing the issue. Building on that, uh, definitely awareness is important. Say for example, in case, a family case I presented, um, people do not understand even what title means. So in real estate kind of property, uh, immovable property, what's important is not possession. There is this hierarchy of property rights, right? Um, so, and benefits therein. Ownership is the topmost uh, um, in the hierarchy of property ownership, uh, property rights. So, hierarchy for, sorry, the ownership of, for uh, real property is established not for mere presence possession, but for possessing the title for it. Like it's very intangible kind of right. So some people get deceived uh, by the fact that they're living in the property, they're possessing it, they're using it even in a limited way, and then they feel they're owners, right? That's not the case. Uh, someone with a better 
uh, property right with ownership with a title might come and dispose them right so in that case it's good to know about the importance of title the important the importance of paperwork in relation to the property sorry the ownership so one is that we have to create that awareness and the second step is a complicated layer of getting title clear so it involves a lot of things it has financial implications sometimes in case there are different um, uh, free legal aid programs these days right uh, the eligibility for those programs varies from you know the purpose that the organizations are established in my area say for example there is a, a legal aid a free legal aid center called three rivers legal service i uh, was volunteering with them and i know it so there is eligibility criteria so people can get check their eligibility and then get service to um, avoid financial uh, problems that they are uh, facing with yes so thank you uh, what they you have to do is like once awareness should be created and then uh, deal with uh, the process of getting the title clearance thank you all right that now concludes the q a portion for our grad panel we are going to take a five minute break before the next panel thank you so much So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to today's roundtable on how the media can uplift Black property and heirs property issues. I am Dr. Angela Arge, Director of the Journalism Program here at Boston College, as well as an Associate Professor of English and African and African Diaspora Studies, and I will be the moderator for today's roundtable discussion. Um, I'm going to begin by just giving an overview of how the session will go. So first, I will present brief introductions uh, for each of our panelists. Each panelist will then kind of give a five-minute um, presentation talk discussing their professional and personal experience with the issue of heirs' property. Um, I will then ask a couple of general questions for each of the panelists to address before opening up the conversation to the audience for Q&A. Um, before we get, begin, I do wanna share that today's panel will run for only an hour until about 4 p.m. Unfortunately, we have lost two panelists due to illness today, Dolores Barclay and Lizzie Presser. However, I will still read their brief bios as their work directly informs our discussion today. So to begin. Dolores Barkley is the project manager at the Ira A. Lippman Center for Journalism and Civil and Human Rights, as well as an adjunct associate professor at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. In 2002, she and Todd Lewin co-wrote a three-part investigative series for the Associated Press called Torn from the Land, which documented the massive loss of wealth Black Americans have suffered through land loss, often by raw racial intimidation and violence, but also through arcane legal loopholes and trickery. Uh, the series received many accolades, including the Aronson Prize for Social Justice Journalism, the Grio Award of the New York Association of Black Journalists, and a nomination for the Pulitzer Prize. Barclay and Lewin's groundbreaking series remains a pivotal and much studied work in the ongoing scholarship about heirs' property. Lizzie Presser reports on health and inequality and how policy is experienced for ProPublica. In 2019, in collaboration between ProPublica and The New Yorker, she investigated the issue of heirs' property through the case of Melvin Davis and like Curtis Reels, two brothers who spent eight years in jail fighting for the land that had been a home, a livelihood, and a sanctuary for their family for generations. Lizzie subsequently won the 2020 John Bartlow Martin Award for Public Interest Magazine Journalism, which recognizes 
work that illuminates the causes, consequences, and remedies of problems in American society. And just last year, her article was made into a documentary, Silver Dollar Road, by the critically acclaimed director, Raul Peck. So we are deeply sorry that Dolores and Lizzie cannot be here today with us and wish them both a speedy recovery. They are missed, but they are with us in spirit. As, as, I, as I said, their work deeply informs the work of our remaining panelists who include an award-winning filmmaker, activist, and scholar. So for today's panelists and their bios, Lyle Kendrick is a producer of Vice News, a current uh, affairs digital outlet that produces online documentary essays and videos on underreported stories. In 2021, Lyle helped to produce Losing Ground, a Peabody award-winning documentary that built on the work that Dolores Barkley did 20 years earlier. The stylistic genius of Losing Ground is the way it uses humor and matter-of-fact curiosity and personal stories to humanize a complicated legalistic issue, dramatizing how the law often favors the ruthless. Kim Duhan is a member of the Reels family who were featured in Silver Dollar Road, the documentary adapted from Lizzie Presser's 2019 ProPublica feature. In the documentary, Kim serves as a family spokesperson, as well as a guiding narrative voice, providing an intimate portrait of her family's struggles, as well as their unflagging resolve in the face of dispossession. Through sharing her family's story, Kim allows us to see that heirs' property is not only about the loss of family land and the loss of wealth, but also the loss of priceless and invaluable resources, such as health and education and one sense of purpose and history. And finally, we have Thomas Mitchell, who holds the Robert F. Drennan Endowed Chair at BC Law and serves as the director of the Initiative on Land, Housing, and Property Rights. Professor Mitchell is a national expert on property issues facing disadvantaged families and communities and has published leading scholarly works addressing these matters. He is the principal drafter of a widely adopted Uniform Real Property Act named the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, which is designed to enhance the ability of disadvantaged families to maintain ownership of their property and their property-related generational wealth. 21 states, DC, and the US Virgin Islands have enacted um, this his act into law thus far with bills pending in other state legislatures. In 2020, Professor Mitchell was named one of 21 recipients of the MacArthur Genius Fellowship in recognition of the substantial impact his professional work has had in assisting disadvantaged families and farmers, disadvantaged, disadvantaged farmers and property owners. Um, so, these are our panelists. Please join me in welcoming them to uh, BC in this, this round table. So I will turn it over to them to talk about their personal and professional uh, experience with this property. Yeah, so let me, let me just say something about my vision for this panel initially um, when I was putting together uh, a lot of the conference. So part of it was the trajectory I've had in my career, the impact that the developments since uh, 2000 have had on families and communities, the understanding of this issue in academia, none of this would have happened. Uh, and, and sometimes I say in academic settings that you know our research in terms of trying to actually lead to systemic change is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And that's certainly the case with respect to the issue of heirs property ownership. That um, prior to um, investigative reporters and others in the media taking an interest in this issue, it was really relegated to a very small number of kind of academics and researchers. And it was the AP torn from the land series that just put things on a whole different trajectory. So I teach a course 
One of the courses I teach at the law school is a course on legislative and public policy advocacy. And so, you know, we do all the technical things if we're dealing with um, the part of that class is, is getting uh, something enacted into law through the legislative process. You know, so there are steps. Um, but if you're dealing with an issue that especially that's impacting disadvantaged communities, it, it's critical often to raise public awareness, including to have the media, um, you know, participate in that raising. So that's, you know, for, you know, I've done a lot of work over a lot of years. I'm often like chronically overextended, but I've always wanted to reach back and, and recognize some of these kind of groundbreaking investigative reporters and folks from the media who really have changed the landscape. Um, some way, you know, I am sad that we had some illnesses in the last 48 hours. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate. There's a silver lining to that is that we're gonna have some more free time. And I know a lot of folks here want to, they recognize old friends, they wanna make new friends. I wanna make new friends. I wanna see my old friends. Um, so that's, I think that's going to be a silver lining on that. So that's that, but that really was the, the impetus was that, um, so much of the work that I get credit for, you know, I'm not saying I didn't work hard cause I've worked really hard, got minimal sleep for years, but without the media shining a light on this, most of this would not have been possible. Dolores Barkley, she can't be here today, but she did send some remarks that she wanted me to read to all of you. So I'm going to give those now. So it's titled, How We Found the Story, right? This groundbreaking piece she did in the AP called Torn from the Land. Uh, Todd Lewin and I were musing one night after both turning in stories we had been working on for weeks. Looking for new stories, we started talking about wealth inequities and why Black Americans had been shut out of generational wealth, besides all the reasons that we already knew. We mentioned land ownership, and I mentioned that I knew many families who owned vast swaths of land in the South, but it had disappeared. We had to fight the AP white chan chain of command to get it done. We were told no one had any evidence that this existed. No one had ever complained. It was just a history lesson, lesson, all of which was untrue. Todd and I had to find families and we landed on a University of Mississippi genealogy site and posted a question. The next morning, our email was flooded. We followed their stories found land loss organizations, checked history books and accounts of communities that had been wiped out um, or had, had documented lynchings. And we started finding our first cases. We also found some invaluable sources such as Thomas Mitchell, a PhD student at Wisconsin who was tracking black land in the Mississippi Delta. So this was a very long time ago. <laughs> Armed with enough evidence for a big and significant story, we returned to our AP editors and got the green light and a $50,000 budget, almost unheard of today. We went to the Delta first and met the Wisconsin PhD student who taught us the basics in searching property records. After a couple of weeks, we were pros and able to work with all forms of real estate, estate, banking, and court documents. In courthouses throughout the South and border states, we found scores of white men with legal pads scouring family land. They thought that Todd, who is white, was just another title searcher. Todd and I never talked to each other in courthouses. We'd send texts or wait until we met at the car. It kept us safe from hostile county clerks of which there were many. Our searcher was thrown out of one courthouse while tracking a nasty partition sale. All the cases we investigated, 
in all the family histories we heard of murders and whole communities wiped out and shady loans were horrific and devastating. But the partition sales seemed to irritate us the most because they were continuing and legal and nasty. But we also found families who were able to come together and put their heirs' property under one name and families who began making wills. And this was always good news. So I'm Lyle Kendrick. Um, I started looking into heirs' property in 2019. Um, I was my colleague, Alzo Slade, and I were assigned a general documentary about uh, reparations for when we had a show on Hulu. It was a very general assignment, and uh, both of us were sort of like, all right, I guess we're trying to figure this out. Um, and we ended up having an editor who, or senior producer, who sort of a uh, sort of was just grumbling about like the question of of the racial wealth gap, and he was he was just curious about what happened to people who got what happened to Black Americans who got land after the Civil War. Like, how are they doing now? Is that a good indicator of something that could be used to close the wealth gap? And so it was sort of just a general question. Um, so uh, we came across uh, a, a paper from uh, from Thomas in from the mid two thousands, and I just I just rang him up and we talked for about ninety minutes on the phone, and it was like it was the, sort of the first time that I had heard about this heir's property, and sort of to answer my uh, senior producer's original question. Uh, most of that land was gone. Um, and so um, that sort of ended up being, uh, you know, we were trying to t tie it to a broader story, looking at the discussion around reparations. Um, but I, but, but it sort of became clear that heirs property was something that was um, both fascinating and tragic and something worth exploring in its own right. Um, we ended up, our series ended up moving to the Showtime network, um, which is a 15 minute format, which works, I think, which I think worked, um, better in that case. Um, and so we kind of, from there went through the task of trying to find a good case study for, for this. Um, it was very challenging because this is a story that involves family issues and people being concerned about airing family lawn, dirty laundry and that sort of, and that sort of thing. Um, I have a distinct memory of going down to Florida. We had one family um, and a group of six sisters who were all in the process of clearing title, um, but were all very skeptical. And I have like a, I have a memory of sitting down and being just totally grilled uh, by that for someone to ultimately decide not to um, go on camera for that. So we, so the, the process kind of took a while. Um, we ended up getting connected to um, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives who had the case that we ended up following, which is a family called the Lewises in um, Louisiana, Claiborne Parish. Um, they lost 420 acres of land um, in a partition sale. Um, and so we just sort of centered the story around around them. Um, and, you know, through that sort of used Claiborne Parish and Homer, Louisiana, as sort of our um, as sort of our node for for telling that story. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of our our journey there. Okay. Um, I am Kim Duhan, and I am the product. I am the heir's property. I am the heir of uh, Mitchell Reels, and I feel like my family is a product of this um, the property wealth gap that we are discussing today. If you haven't seen um, Silver Dollar Road, please, please take a moment to Google it, look at it. It's on Amazon Prime. It was produced by Raul Peck and Viola Davis of Juvie Productions. Um, just to piggyback off of what was said about um, Lizzie Presser, who was in a dynamic force when it came down to my family situation. Lizzie came in along with Raul and did a study on my family for almost seven years regarding our situation. My two uncles went to jail for eight years for a land dispute in Carteret County for property that my family rightfully owned. And unfortunately, we are still in some type of litigation with trying to get the property back. Our biggest issue was the will, not having a living will. And unfortunately, 
That's kind of taboo in the African American community, and it is something that really needs to be highlighted. Um, I asked my Aunt Mamie, who's also in the documentary, what her thought was regarding me being on this panel today. What would she add to the situation regarding Ayers' property? And her thought was, which I kind of agree with her, that um, Ayers' property can be a hindrance. And if you don't know about it, it's a dead weight, as it is for my family. Because as we stand right now, we have heirs that didn't, I don't want to say financially contribute, but to a degree they haven't for years. And the two living heirs, which is my great grand, my grandmother and her sister, Classy Curly and Gertrude Reels, have solely been paying the property taxes on this property. And unfortunately, the other heirs who were descendants of their parents still have ownership. And now they're bucking us and contesting us to want to do other things with the property besides live on it, and they don't even live on it. So heirs' property is almost like having a noose around your neck because one person can contest it and you can lose it all. So if we had our way about it, we wouldn't be heirs to that property. We would have done a trust if we could have, you know, to save what property we do have. So when Dolores Barkley published Torn from the Land more than 20 years ago now, Ayers property was practically unheard of. You know, as you heard in her written remarks, her AP editors didn't even think it was a story. But the time that we're living in is, is quite different. Um, there, in the last several years, there have been high profile stories from ProPublica, um, and the New Yorker, and the Wall Street Journal, and Vice, and PBS, um, and that's not even to mention the documentaries, you know, with Silver Dollar Road, and the Gaining Ground uh, documentary that I think there's a screening of this evening, um, and, and my understanding, there are more high-profile stories coming on this particular issue, so I'm wondering if each of you, from your individual perspectives, could talk to us about why this story has such staying power, such resonance in the media right now? Sure. Um, I think I think it's so. So I, I had an interesting experience of working on this while also doing a lot of things related to conservative politics, and so um, it's sort of trippy doing a story about heirs' property and then going to. Southern Baptist churches where they're railing against critical race theory. It's a very interesting kind of convergence of things. So, but, but one thing I think that's been that I, that I've experienced is that, um, I spend a lot of my time having to convince, um, audience, uh, to convince, of uh, quite conservative voices, um, why they should trust, um, a piece that I, I mean, that, that I'd be doing. And I think one thing with this that I think is interesting is that it sort of converges a lot of different values. I think there's issues of racial inequality that are are very clear and paramount, but also it's there's issues of self-sufficiency and um, building personal wealth that I think finds resonance in, in some unexpected places. So um, as I've been, my experience with this has involved a lot of, um, uh, I, I can send this to some you know, folks who, who, for lack of a better phrase, are quite MAGA and uh, get a, a, a lot of interest. I've I've been very surprised by um by the interest in in the issue um sort of in 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 unexpected in ex unexpected places. So I also think generally it fits into like a pattern where we see that stories that represent a fuller breadth of our population. There's actually a lot of demand for that. But sometimes you have the power structures, and I just I'm thinking about Hollywood right now. So um, you know, we just had the Oscars. There was the unexpected success success of uh, one movie, American Fiction. Um, I actually, my classmate in college was Jeffrey Wright. Um, so I actually was there when he got his start. But part of his start actually reflects something else. We went to Amherst College. The theater department would never cast black folks. So Jeffrey got his start because there was an alternative black theater group that came together. And we did a play, uh, it was about the, uh, the, 
the book, Bloods of uh, African American Vietnam War Vets. And it became a thing on campus. You know, we didn't have it in the main theater because they wouldn't let us have it there. We had it in a student union and it was packed every night that we had it. So there was this convergence between what the powers that be thought was legitimate theater um, and what the popular demand was. And I think I just saw something uh, after the Oscars that said that films that cast a um, significant number of black and brown people actually are doing better at the box office. So I think there, I think there is this underlying, um, you know, general kind of interest. But it's also true what Lyle says is that this is an issue that actually impacts all kinds of people, disproportionately black and brown, but not exclusively. Um, there's probably more in absolute numbers, more white heirs, property owners. There's this issue just, I think, in our society about property rights and this almost visceral uh, belief that those are should be protected. And then you kind of weave in the kind of the history and the culture um, that just makes, you know, as, as horrible as these stories are, it they're powerful human interest stories. Um, in my experience, and I'm just gonna speak about um, Silver Dollar Road. Since I've been the liaison person for my family, there has been an onslaught of people reaching out to me um, via social media, telling me that they either know people in a situation similar to this or their experience in a situation similar to this. And I was kind of overwhelmed because I thought we were the only people that had such a um, horrendous situ situation. And it wasn't just black people, there were white people and brown people, people from everywhere, all nations, just reaching out and saying, I can relate to this. This is something that I've experienced or I know somebody that's experiencing it. And the unfortunate thing is people are surprised that um, with you saying you have a document that supports the fact that you own something, that people are still literally able to come in and take your property. And there should be something done with the legislators to prevent this from happening. You know, so the right now with Silver Dollar Road, I was kind of taken back by what you were saying earlier with the story that you've done. I was blown away that this is happening and it's not um, it's not unheard of anymore and it's so egregious. And what is our legislators doing to help us? Because in the state of North Carolina, I really do feel like my family has been blindsided. And I really do wish there was something that could be done to undo what was done. It was egregious on so many levels. So one more question before I turn it over to the audience for Q&A. Um, I'm wondering what you think now that we have the public's attention about this egregious um, violation of property rights that supposedly means so much to the nation. What stories, what angles, what approaches should journalists be taking to continue to build on the momentum of getting the story out? Uh, I think I think this I think the heirs' property story has been it's been I think focused on several states across the South to, typically. That sort of I, I think that there's. Um, I think there's a lot more work to be done, especially in urban areas. I know that, like, I, I know the work that that Scott's doing in New York City uh, covers covers that quite a lot. Um, I think that um, there's also, I'm sure, you know, when we were doing this story, we were also looking in places in states that, you know, we have, we hadn't even thought of places in Appalachia that that were other um, areas that I haven't seen a ton of coverage um, about this. But I would say, um, yeah, I I, I meant, I'm just be curious to see, like, I, I think. There's a lot of different land issues and you know informal title all over the country, and I think um, uh, yeah, finding unexpected pockets of it would be um, probably what I would say. The universal the universality of the story. Okay. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. When you look at states that have enacted the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, they're in every region of the country, and there's egregious stories in each of the regions. 
about how families lost their property rights and had them extinguished through just very unjust practices. Um, you know, I can tell you stuff in Hawaii. I can tell you stuff in New Mexico that's tied to what happened at the end of the U.S.-Mexico war. Um, I mean, just some, you know, just incredibly terrible stories of essentially legalized land theft. Um, but I also think building on, I mean, there there has been, I think about it in terms of Kim's comment that th there kind of as a result of some of the media coverage, it has resulted in some legislative reform. But I always tell people that like it's first generation, right? And there needs to be multiple other kind of um, um, other legislative reforms, other policy reforms. You know, I do think that we've kind of established that some legislative reform can be done and the media has been helpful in that. But then just, you know, if we, there's no need to just limit it to eminent to um, heirs property. I mean, there's been gross abuse of eminent domain on particular, and I, you know, that's ripe for its own set of media stories. There's been gross abuse of kind of tax foreclosures. Um, so anyway, that, that, this, there's there's lots more that can be done. I have actually done a panel at um, UNC uh, UNC Central Law School. I think it was UNC Central, North Carolina Central Law School. And um, I was kind of, I was impressed with the students that were in journalism and they were taking um, very strong measures to get out there in, the, in society and ask questions and find out you know, people, uh, situations similar to ours, and they had a multitude of questions. So for me, the next generation is imperative with journalism, general, journalism, sorry, to get out there and ask the questions, the necessary questions to bring this information to the public. There are a lot of reels out there that are um, dealing with the same things. And if you don't know, if you don't un uncover those stones, you'll never know. So I think it's really good that they have classes, courses, and, um, uh, what is it, roundtable discussions that bring the, the awareness out there. So I think our next generation is really going to be key to this with journalism. Yeah, could you say one thing on that about another importance of the media and it relates to students is that, so I mentioned to you that without the media, without Torn from the Land, there would be no Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. So let me be a little more specific about that. It was Torn from the Land that got the attention of the American Bar Association, specifically their real property trust in the state law section. Um, there was somebody in the leadership there who had always, you know, very loyal to the section, but had been nudging them. He said, as wonderful as all the work that we do, you know, why are we always doing work that implicates the top 2% of wealth in terms of their property challenges? Like, what about the 98%? And he had been kind of nudging them for a few years and then torn from the land came and whoever was the chair of the section said, hey, David, you know, you're always bugging us. Like, why don't you do something with this? And that was when they put together something called the Property Preservation Task Force. I was asked to be on it. And that was the genesis of our ideas for developing this model state statute. But so that that's just to, to make it just more concrete. But I think a really exciting development, so I'll restrict this to law schools and property students, is the area of law that heirs property is a subset of is called tenancy in common ownership. When I was in law school, it was actually a lot of our property course was very different than I imagined. Because I thought like we all would go into the course knowing something about property. We had all lived in a house where somebody rented or owned. And you'd be surprised how property law, there's a lot of arcane terminology. I had a professor in law school who taught it as if we were living in England in the 15th century. Um, it was a snooze fest, right? I'd rather kind of watch paint dry. Um, I know I had to learn it to pass a bar exam, but, but you know, I think some of my work has tried to humanize that, but the, the Vice documentary, um, I know now a score of property law professors in this country who when they teach tenancy and common ownership, they show the Vice video. And I have uniformly heard 
from, and I just, uh, I just was a guest lecturer in, by Zoom with um, Albany Law students in, in one of their property classes. And they uniformly say that that's become their most favorite part of the course because it humanizes it. And so now you're training a generation of law students as opposed to what happened before that where people were kind of alienated by just the terminology, by the seeming lack of relevance. So I think that's just been an incredible contribution. And I don't even, it's definitely gonna be bearing fruit in terms of these law students turned lawyers who will then be serving communities that they might otherwise have not served. That's great, thank you. <laughs> As I think we benefited from, we had our correspondent, Alza Slade, who's in LA, so cannot be here, is kind of the, he, he's, he's a philosopher and a stand-up comedian by background and then became a journalist. So I think that um, curious approach, I think sort of, uh, Defined, defined to that piece. I'm wishing my journalism students were in the room so they could hear again just how important what we do is, how, um, and that telling stories, like having, being able to weave in personal stories with the history and with all the legal scholarship makes a real impact in the world. Um, and then talking not just about the legal stuff, but the impact on human beings makes other people buy in right and care and the final thing i'll say i'm not i'm not on the panel but the final thing i will say is that i think it's important for journalists to not only show us the scope of the problem but to show us what organizations and people um, are doing to address the problem so people who read will get a sense of agency and feel like there is actually something that can be done Right, we don't just have to say, "Oh, whoa, is is all of us because things are so, so terrible." So I appreciate. Again, I wish my students were here to um, hear how important journalism is in these particular issues. Okay, I do want to turn it over unless we have other comments here or questions from the audience. We would just like to remind the audience members to please state your name and where you are coming from. Hi, uh, JC Fisher. I'm an attorney um, that does Ayers Property in Alabama. First of all, inspired by all three of you so much. Um, the Vice documentary we've used, I've seen it a hundred times. We've used it for training after training after training. It is the only um, short documentary that has really allowed not only attorneys, but judges who are not familiar with the UPHPA in Alabama who are not familiar with the dangers of heirs property for them to actually understand and grasp why it's a problem, especially in a state where almost all of the real estate developers who bring partition actions are attorneys. And there's a reason for that. But that vice documentary has made such a difference in my state. And so I wanna thank you for that. Kim. It's, it's kind of, it's emotional for me because we've represented hundreds of heirs property owners in Alabama. Before Silver Dollar Road um, was widely available to the public, the, first of all, this work is very, there's a lot of vicarious trauma uh, that you, you take on from the landowner because the landowner is defeated before you really even get involved. And then when you get involved, they're still defeated and you can only go as far as your client is willing to go. I cannot tell you how many times that documentary, I have had clients come to me and say, I'm ready to, I'm ready to do this. I saw Silver Dollar Road, I'm ready to move forward. Yes, let's do this. Because so many times I say, we need to appeal this. We need to appeal this to the Supreme Court. We need, we need to take this. And they say, I just don't have the energy to do it anymore. And then they see your documentary and, and then I can really help them because they're ready to help themselves because you all kept fighting and you are a pillar of strength and you come from a long line of strong ancestors. Please keep fighting because you have inspired so many of my heirs property clients in Alabama. So thank you so much. I know it's not a question, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I have to follow JC with tears. Oh, that's
Okay, we'll, we'll go here and then we'll have a question from the online audience. Okay, yes. I'll try to clean my tears up. Thank you, JC. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I'm Mavis Gregg. I'm also a death and dirt attorney like JC, currently a Loeb Fellow at Harvard. Um, and uh, I am curious about the fact that a lot of the media attention to heirs property does frame it in the context of social justice or social injustice, but it's also, you know, impacting all of our climate resiliency, it's impacting markets. And I'm curious if you all think that um, any kind of media attention to those aspects of it could elevate it for black heirs property owners, et cetera. So let me just say that, um, like when I started my work, it was only portrayed as a problem impacting black families who owned not just rural land, but farmland in the rural South, right? Um, and the assumption back then was, well, too bad for them, right? But that there was there were no kind of cross-cutting issues except for maybe the extraction of wealth from those families. So, you know, one of the things in terms of advocating for the Uniform Partition Act um, is we've tried to help make it more universal in terms of who's impacted, right? So we typically say families of many races and ethnicities, though maybe disproportionately black and brown. But in some of the, um, you know, in any state that we were working in, one of the first things we try to do is build a coalition. And there has been in uh, not all states, but a number of states, there's been the participation in that coalition of folks from the environmental community. Um, I think I'm going to talk about it a little bit more tomorrow during the fireside chat I'm going to have with our dean. And I'll share with you the some war stories from Florida, but suffice it to say, um, it was an environmental organization. It turns out there was Defenders of Wildlife, who really was the primary champion there because of seeing the impacts of heirs property sold in terms of negative impacts on the, the environment. In I think, as you know, in you know our long running fight, we're going to be fighting in North Carolina a long time. Um, you know. Um, but we have the support from land trust, same thing as in Virginia. So I think you're right that there are these other elements um, in terms of um, impacts on the environment and climate change, for example, that are not ones that's been highlighted thus far in the media, but hopefully um, they will. I also wanna say to you guys a lot, Mavis is a superstar when she said, you kind of said it this way, Mavis. I am Mavis Gregg, she's from North Carolina. She's a rock star, estate planning attorney, an entrepreneur. Um, and then, but you said it this way, Mavis. You said, hi, I'm Mavis Gregg, um, and I'm doing the Loeb Fellowship at Harvard University. So just because you're at Boston College, <laughs> just because you're on our turf now, you own it. Uh, she's at Harvard University doing this incredibly prestigious Loeb Fellowship, and we welcome you. And then you're also going to hear from J.C. Fisher, who's a rock star uh, attorney in Alabama, representing a number of heirs property owners, and she's on a panel tomorrow, so you'll hear more from J.C. Hi, my name's David Price. I'm the associate director at the Initiative on Land, Housing, and Property Rights, uh, and I'm looking at the Q&A and trying to pass on some questions, and one of one of those was, to what extent, and this is for anyone and everyone, is the story of heirs' property not just a story of complicated legal issues, but a story of outright corruption on the local level? To what extent have you seen that in, in the stories you've looked at? Our corruption is unbelievable. It is egregious. I hate to keep using that word, but the corruption in our county I felt like it was premeditated. I've had people that kind of told us in the roundabout way, you guys need to stop fighting. They're not gonna let you have your property back. Um, we know that you know it's your property. We went all the way up to the Supreme Court and we were still denied. And unfortunately, well, should I say fortunately for um, us, um, Lizzie Presser got involved and that was the only way we were able to tell our story. The courts would not hear us. They knew that we owned our property, but unfortunately, they wanted it. 
the, they wanted the developers to have it. So our legal system in Carteret County, to me, is not trustworthy. And it was egregious how they did our family and how they do others. It was premeditated, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, you know, I, th I think that um, there's some elements of that, just even in the torn from the land. There was um, one of the earliest uh, examples I came across. There's um, the Federation of Southern Cooperative Land Assistance Fund had this, um, you know, incredibly important study um, that when I was doing my research in the, uh, I think it was done in 1984. So when I was doing my research in the mid nineties, I came across, but I think in that they referenced, I think it was a judge in Alabama who in the probate process had personally been able to acquire something like thousands of acres of land, um, abusing his, uh, his position. Um, you know, our, our act has generally been very effective in the states that have enacted but we've had pockets of resistance, including, I think, there is a number of judges in Alabama that, even though they're required to apply our act, are not applying. And I've heard that we have another pocket of resistance in Arkansas. Um, you know, so one of the things when I teach my, my course is on legislative and public policy advocacy, like I'll focus on the legislative part. Your work's not done when you get your bill enacted into law, there's the whole monitoring um, and trying to then, you know, perhaps with the media raising awareness about corruption or, or folks who are just trying to flout what the law is. Um, my experience when we were doing this was um, there, I think I, I, it's, it's almost tough to say corruption when the folks were so blatant that were doing things like what, what we were, like I, I, I found the guy that we interviewed for the the, the um, real estate um, investor who basically targets heirs property, and um, it's kind of tough to be like this is a like a, he's he's hiding. He, he was his website is like yeah we'll deal with heirs property issues. When I met him, he described himself as nefarious. It was a very sort of uh, so so I guess um, I, I I think there's. Um, my experience was there was cottage industries that were kind of built around that. Um, I also think, for instance, like the clerk of court, that was someone that we dealt with quite a lot for this. Um, I don't think saw the forest and the trees until our piece came out. He called me afterwards. He's like, I deal with this all the time. I don't think I see how this stuff actually affects people beyond like the paperwork that I do. Um, and then I think the the legal ease that a lot of folks have to navigate is, is a is a big issue. Um, uh, the folks that we were, uh, the, the folks that we were following, I think were, you know, many, many steps behind by the time, um, by the time they were able to take any action. I'll say one thing, because Steve Malpezzi's in the room, we asked a question earlier. So I took Steve, ended up getting a Ford Foundation grant, it was around 2000. And I wanted to study some communities that had gotten land during the New Deal. And there were two sites, rural Mississippi and um, Eastern North Carolina were our possible sites. So we, I took them and another colleague who's at USC now, Richard Green, on this little field trip to rural Mississippi and Eastern North Carolina, and we visited a number of registered deeds office. But I always remember, I think it was Forest County, Mississippi we were in. So we went to, we were talking to the registered deeds. It was lovely woman who was, seems like she was in her early 60s, uh, white woman named, I just remember it, BJ. Um, and so we're saying, you know, we're on this research team, we're looking at some different forced sales and trying to see if people are getting fair value. I think that's, there was more to our study. We didn't share the kind of racial part of our study. Um, and so I remember BJ looking at us and saying, well, you're a very kindly and a very genteel voice. Uh, you know, you're 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 kind of wasting your time because everything is that we do here is fair. And so she was then talking about tax sales, in particular. Um, and she said, you know, the way we run the tax sales here in in Forest County is like we don't have these auctions. I mean, that's kind of savage. You know, that's not civilized to have a bunch of people coming and bidding up. What we do here is, is we, there's a limited number of 
company, real estate companies too. And we let them take turns having exclusive bidding, which is total violation of the law. But it had been so embedded in that county that I don't think she even realized she was saying, hey, we're totally corrupt here in Forest County. Uh, we, we, we are really into flouting the law. Um, but, it, but it showed you how deeply ingrained that was, at least in that particular county. Yes. She's coming with the mic. Good afternoon. My name is Rodney Benson. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I have heirs property in the state of Texas. I know I'm here among a lot of legal minds, many accomplished. But I just had a basic question in regards to the US Constitution and the Fourth Amendment in regards to being secure in your property. It would take a legal mind to bridge the gap between heirs' property, the partition sale laws, to the Fourth Amendment, and have the US government come in and make a judgment and say, in the instance of that vice special, where it shows egregious application of partition sales to someone's property and how the government can step in and legislate and correct this wrong. No, no, no. I, I'm just gonna make sure I, I don't know if I totally, I don't know if I totally have the best, have the best answer uh, for it. So I don't know if there's another way of reframing it. So essentially, are you asking, should there be constitutional protections that would prevent? Yeah. Based on the Fourth Amendment. Yeah. So I'm not, um, I think maybe at a theoretical level, right? And I think, um, but I'm not sure how far. Let, let me give you an analogy. Um, and this is going to be the Fifth Amendment like the um, takings. So if you're gonna have your property taken by the government or somebody that the government has delegated that taking authority to, what you're supposed to be entitled to is, first of all, it's only supposed to be for a public use, which has been broadly defined, but you're supposed to be paid just compensation, which the Supreme Court has interpreted mean fair market value. And there are a ton of eminent domain situations in this country where people have been paid a pittance, nothing approaching fair market value. And it just seems with the current constitution of our court, but not just current, this seems like it goes back to others. They've just not been sympathetic to kind of claims that people weren't paid the, what the constitution literally tells them is their right. Luana Grave Sellers, Low Country Gullah Foundation, and I'm out of Hilton Head Island. And I'm telling you I'm from Hilton Head Island because I'm sure most of the people in this room have heard the Josephine Wright story. Um, so a couple of things that I wanna say. First of all, thank you both for the work that you're doing. Um, the VICE link is on my website because case studies like yours are what I use to help people to get past the, um, the dirty little family laundry scenario that they're going through to realize that there are other people out there in the world. So I really appreciate your standing up and the fight that you're doing. It's an important fight, it's a hard fight, and there are people out there that are doing things with you. One of the things that was very important to me in the work that I do, um, and just to give you a little bit of background, we help people unravel heirs' property issues as well as help pay their um, property taxes. So that's the work that we do. 
And one of the things that we found is education is the primary thing that has made a lot of the people, whether they have heirs property issues or are just within the community aware. And that led to the Josephine Wright story, getting the legs that it did and getting the national attention that it did. And it's, and, and it's also the reminder through the media that every time I've done an interview, I make sure that they know that Josephine is not the only one. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people out there. And I think that's the critical part of the puzzle, that making sure that people are aware that this is a systemic problem, it's a critical problem, and it's something that needs to be resolved. The other thing is someone mentioned um, corruption in Beaufort County. If you have heirs property issues, you cannot use a local attorney. You have to go outside of the area, sometimes to Columbia or Charleston, just to get a, an attorney that is not tied into the good old boy system that the judges have. And so educating the judges and the attorneys and making it more of a, a um, overall scenario is the, is the process that we're using here. Um, in South Carolina, but um, of course, it's it's a situation that is also going all over the place. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Great panel. My name is Miles Lennon. I'm an environmental anthropologist at Brown University. My question is for Kim. Um, I I think you referenced. Uh, you said something to the effect that if you could do it all over again, you put your land in a trust or if that was a possibility. And I'm wondering, um, with all the outreach you've gotten from other people in similar situations, do you ever share that advice? Is that is that something that gets talked about? Absolutely, I do. And my situation and our situation is, I tell them our situation is medicine for somebody else. Don't let what happened to the reals happen to you. So this is, it is educational. Yeah, we would definitely do a trust, and I would definitely recommend a trust. There's a question here. I got, got a question from the Q&A. Uh, following up on Professor Mitchell's observation that media can play a role in not just in spotlighting problems, lifting up solutions, the question was, are there any specific resources that could be mentioned for owners of air property around the country that they could turn to online or, or in person? Yeah, so I'm going to, in the interest of time, because we've got about two minutes, there are, but I, I actually like that question because I'm going to transition. You know, so I've, I think Torn from the Land was one of the first times I got interviewed. Um, you know, I'll just say on airs. But when I say that there's interest in this topic, I, I think I've had 170 interviews and I've basically stopped talking to the media because I've got other work i got to do. Um, but one of my frustrations earlier on after Torn from the Land was that the journalists really wanted to talk about all of the horror, the damage. And then I would kind of tell them during the course of the interview, well, there are folks doing stuff, right? And, you know, maybe it's nascent, but there is hope. And I gave them specific examples. And for the longest time, they weren't interested in that because somehow it made the story less dramatic. Um, which I just found incredibly frustrating because it just seems like it was designed to rob people of hope, right? Get that short tick on that click of, oh, I just saw, heard another horrible story, but not leading to anything. Um, and I'll just give you an example of, you know, Lizzie, uh, for example, just did um, just kind of an awesome part when she uh, she had her piece that she did an appendix that had a number of resources and there's actually a family in the Gaining Ground documentary you're gonna see, and Eternal Polk, the director, just walked in. Um, but that family found assistance by looking at Lizzie's appendix on the cusp of losing their like 160 acres, and they ended up retaining it. So I don't wanna say, uh, I just wanna say there are resources, but we can't do it in two minutes. This will be our last question. Uh, yeah, I'm Robert Zabawa Tuskegee, not as old as Thomas thinks I am. 
Um, but uh, I want to piggyback on the device video and how important it is. Um, at Tuskegee, we're also part of what is the Alabama Airs Property Alliance with Auburn University and Alabama A&M and other groups, and lawyers and JC. And um, yesterday, uh, we did a Airs Property workshop in Selma, Alabama, and um, we showed the video. And then afterwards, we're having lunch, and a woman came up to me and she says, you know, that video is, was really important to her. And I said, well, why? And she said, because she owns some land, or her family owns some heirs property in Louisiana. And she kept telling her father, you know, you need to do something about this. And he kept saying, no, 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 I paid the taxes. I paid the taxes. And she kept saying, well, I don't know if that's enough. And now she saw the video and she took down the YouTube address and she's showing her father that just because you pay the taxes doesn't mean that the land is secure. So thank you very much for that. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Also. We, we spoke at one point during the reporting of this process. I, I spoke with a lot of people in this room. So just like, thank you for fielding my dumb questions during, during that time period. I, yeah, thank you. We actually have time for one more question. Anybody? Woo. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Austin uh, with UPD Consulting. We're a management consulting company that um, uh, focuses on equity change management. Uh, I'm a sort of recent uh, uh, entree into heirs property. We developed a model to deal with inherited property in urban areas. And in, in researching the concept paper, uh, we were exposed to this community and the resonance of our, of our model is is uh, you know, uh, pretty strong, and and my my question to you is as members of the the, uh, the media and the sort of publicity on on this is are there are there stories that are in development or that are out there on the sort of the neighborhood impact of this this issue in urban in urban settings. And what I mean by that is that in, in some neighborhoods, in some traditionally black neighborhoods, the literal complexion of the neighborhood is changing because there isn't anything that, that, that the heirs to these properties can economically do with their properties. And they're, they're prime targets for uh, investors who come in and, and you know, underpay for, for uh, what property is worth, you know, uh, put some modest investment in the property and flip it. And then as the neighborhood uh, appreciates, the people who benefit from that appreciation are the original investors, or, or those investors, the the um, uh, first time home buyers who are buying the properties, typically white families. And the only people who haven't benefited were the original black owners of these properties. And I, I, I haven't seen a lot of attention on that issue. And I'm curious if, if you can point me to any. So let me just um, give you one. Um, so I mentioned Scott, Kowanowski's in the room. Could you raise your hand again, Scott? Scott's in New York. Um, so in New York, um, we had tried to advocate for the Uniform Partition Act three times between 2011 and 2016. And they said no each time. And the third time they said no. And they said no means no. Don't ever come back to us again. These were the folks in the legislature and other important stakeholders. Well, Scott was working with an investigative reporter for, I think it's New York City's largest television station, NY1. And in, was it 2020? Um, 2019. Um, this incredible, who was almost going to be on the panel today, Lydia Hu, did this award-winning series on the these... Uh, um, rings of real estate speculators in New York who are preying upon these black families. Um, and it was horrible, kind of like the vice, uh, what happened to that family was horrible. But what it did is, you know, and this is, you know, for folks who don't do legislative work, if you're at the end of March in a legislative session, it's usually over. Like within a week of Lydia's um, 
investigative report airing on NY1, there was almost a competition among members of the New York legislature to see who could be the first to introduce our act. And then Scott and I worked together to actually put some enhanced protections in place. So I'd start, it's, it's called going, going, gone. And then there's a colon. And I forget what's after the colon. But if you just put NY1, going, going, gone. So then the last thing I'll turn you to is, I mentioned Heather Way. Is she still here? Okay, so Heather is this law professor at University of Texas, and she, with her students, developed um, a statute in Texas that enables heirs, property owners who are owners and occupiers of their home to access the homestead exemption, which significantly lowers their property taxes. Um, so, for example, there's a neighborhood, I used to live in Dallas before I moved to Boston. There's a neighborhood 10, um, like five or 10 minutes south of the of downtown. And it was one of the only three neighborhoods black families were able to buy homes in the 50s. Um, and it's gentrifying. Um, so if you can claim the homestead exemption, she showed this one home. Um, no, if you, if you don't have the homestead exemption, the property taxes were $11,000. But if you had the home ex homestead exemption, it was $1,500. So anyway, so you should, you know, look for Heather Way. She's she's actually going to be on our panel as well. So that's all the time we have for today's panel. Please join me in thanking our panelists for a great conversation. Uh, I am uh, Dwayne Goldman. I'm currently serving as the uh, inaugural Senior Advisor for Racial Justice and Equity at USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. And um, I've, I've known Mr. Mitchell and, and his work, uh, admired it from afar. And then after coming into the department, really rely on him for technical expertise and keeping us straight. Uh, but I wanted to sincerely thank you and this Sam and the crew for assembling this group of uh, experts here and, and hopefully the stakeholders will walk away with some stuff that will, that will help them. Heirs property. You know, I am, uh, uh, here's what I wanted to do in, in, in the next 15, 20 minutes. Um, this one, um, this one is not necessarily difficult for me. As complicated as this issue is, it's not particularly difficult because as a uh, third generation farmer, my maternal and paternal grandparents farmed in Southeast Arkansas, uh, 10 of 11 kids, parents are gone, deceased now, and both my mom and my dad had large families. So it hits near and dear to me. In fact, um, the Ford place, which was my mother's maiden name, and the Goldman Place were right across the county line from each other in Southeast Arkansas. My mother and father met while they were working on their respective farms, developed a love, went this way, and then came back and raised 11 kids on those two farms. Uh, and I still am a third generation farmer. I work at USDA, but I still farm in Arkansas. And that's largely due to my positive association with agriculture as a kid growing up. And it's not lost on me that the land that those recently freed slaves came and homesteaded on or purchased enabled that union and had a lot to do with me being here. So I wanted to talk about the land itself and how heirs property has creeped into, in particular, the black community and in, in, in Native American farmers. It's called fractionated land and the very similar issues. But I want to talk about the value of the land itself. Because I think it's important for us to understand that and put this in, in, in context. You probably have all heard the stories. Now, 1920, Black folks were about 14% of the population in this country and comprised about 14% of the farmers in this country. That's not a big surprise because they were brought here as farm laborers, operating on about 16 million acres. Today, the, 19, the 2020 two census we just released a couple of months ago. And black farmers are now less than 
one and a half percent of the total. Operating on about two million acres and is the most rapidly declining demographic among all the farmers that we enumerate. So we, we hear that and, and we talk about the bookends, 19, 20, 24, but it's almost disingenuous to talk about the decline without talking about some key things that happened during that decline. A lot of it at the hands of the very agency that I work for. The Ag Adjustment Act of 1933 put in processes to control production and thereby increasing prices of important commodities. In the South, that commodity, let's make no mistake, was cotton. And so they left the critical elements of that legislation up to what was established as county committees for the first time. And those county committees, as you can imagine, were comprised of the larger landowners in the given counties and if I was being totally transparent, I would say the larger white landowners in those counties that made critical decisions as to how that land and how those resources would be divvied up. Uh, they, they shepherded resources to go to the landowners versus the operators, a lot of whom were sharecroppers, a lot of whom were sharecroppers with valid contracts to actually purchase the land they, that they were working on. But when those resources were intercepted, they were forced off the land. That was in the 1930s. In the 1950s, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll share with you, I told you I'm a farmer. I'm an agronomist by training. Agriculture is very familiar to me. So when we talk about this decline, we have to talk about things that happened in the 50s. We hear about the Northern migration when black folks left the South in wholesale numbers. But a lot of that was due to a couple of things. One was, Agriculture became more mechanized. Cotton pickers replace hand picking. Chemicals, synthetic fertilizers replaced manual labor, chopping cotton and the like. But these crop protection products, this mechanization shifted the capital burden of agriculture. You had to have more money up front in order to invest in those things. And for the first time, we saw this situation where the mandate in farming became get big or get out. But when discrimination and racism rears its ugly head, and you happen to be darker skin, that becomes a, almost a singular mandate to get out. And we saw that. We had another pivotal point in the 1970s. We had a secretary of agriculture that boldly said, hey, plant fence row to fence row, get big or get out. And there was another explosion where we saw a rapid decline and those people that were struggling with discrimination and racism. And as recently as the last administration, we heard that again, get big or get out. But we still had these discrimination issues hanging in the balance. And woven into that was the value of the very land that farmers call their resources. In fact, Dr. Denise Francis of the University of Massachusetts at Boston estimated that in the 20th century, the loss of black land was $326 billion. That's what it'd be. It's a thousand million, a thousand, thousand, thousand. You know, it's a lot, right? And that's just the economic value of the land. Think about the disruption to the lifestyles and the important part that being a landowner played in the development of this country. Just as a couple of examples. In 1897, there was a recently freed slave named George Denny was born a slave in Kentucky. And when he was freed, he actually went and bought land, raised a family, started farming. But when the powers that be came to take his land, the Klan formed a mob outside his home. They fired in, he fired back out. Killed one, wounded a couple of other ones. And for the first time, because he owned his land, he was able to claim that he defended his property, kind of an early version of stand your ground. He was convicted, but later pardoned by the governor. But he had to leave because they were still after him. They burned his house, ran his family off. But he later sued because they was able to identify KKK members and was able to sue and get some compensation for losing. That was, that was 1897. And it gets a little closer than that. 
1957, in my home state of Arkansas, there was a gentleman named Isidore Banks, World War I veteran, farmer, landowner, was farming about 1,000 acres, had sharecroppers on his place, but he was rumored to be having an intimate relationship with the white lady that lived on his farm. And he was rumored to be heavy handed in protecting his daughters from having to succumb to the advances, unwanted advances of people, particularly those from a different race. And in June of, that, of 1957, he found himself, or they found him, hanged, burned, and his genitals mutilated because he had too much for a Negro, is what they said. And all this wasn't discovered until much, much later when a $7 million donation was made to the local church based on the profits derived from that land that was taken from him. So historically, there have been certain privileges that are associated with land ownership. At one point, a person had to own land to be able to vote. If you wanted to exercise a freedom to operate, if you wanted to plant a garden instead of just growing cotton, you had to own the land. There have been articles written and stories told about people that had a better style of life because they owned the land and had a sense of autonomy. If you own your land, you could actually send your kids to school versus having them work on the farm, which gave them a leg up for future generations. These economic gains came from owning a little chunk of land. So when we run into issues like heirs' property, it's no mistake that barriers and hurdles are placed, okay? There's, there's some practical justifications for heirs' property. As people in the rural South saw their land taken away when they went in, in some cases tried to participate in the legal system, in other cases, tried to participate with, again, the government, USDA. And they went in with land and came out with less than. And so a lot of people just came up with the conclusion that it would be safer to just leave it alone and let it go to the children. And that was a fatal error. So because of this, we've had missed opportunities around heirs' property. And again, Mr. Mitchell, I'm glad to see you elevating this issue and bringing this to light. A lack of clear title renders ineligibility for a lot of federal programs. And we're looking at that from a lot of different angles. The heirs' property relending program was instituted to clear title to lands so that these benefits could be unlocked and have people actually turn that land into the valuable asset that it was intended to be. But oftentimes we found situations where this heirs' property relending program, and you'll hear from some of my colleagues who are here, you'll hear from them tomorrow talking about those programs, but they're underutilized, and you'll hear some of the things that the Farm Service Agency is doing, trying to provide benefits to those owners to make sure that they can unlock those benefits and make those, again, valuable assets. You probably have heard us talking about the Equity Commission. The Equity Commission is a group of external experts. So just yesterday, I was at a conference in Chicago talking about the food justice system, inequities in, the, in our food systems. And I was explaining the four or five recommendations that dealt specifically with how we can improve food availability, affordable, healthy, safe, nutritious food to people who are in food deserts or don't have access to those benefits. But I understand, Mr. Mitchell, this is an heirs' property conference. So I'm going to talk about the recommendations from the Equity Commission that deal specifically with heirs' property. And in working with the commission, I was glad to see them take that on. Because once again, one of the common things with heirs' property is the first thing that happens. And, and I was glad to hear some of the discussion about how this impacts urban areas because it's the same MO, right? It's the same modus, of, uh, modus operandi, that, that the land becomes in some way underutilized, devalued, and more subject to be taken over. So we've really got to figure out how we can un clear title and revalue the land so that the families understand that there's an 
economic jewel out here that needs to be protected. And the Equity Commission took this on. They released their final report, like I say, about a month ago, February 22nd, and we were proud. Uh, we were also challenged to actually deliver on as many of those 66 recommendations as we could. There was one particular one that dealt with heirs' property, and, and, it, and it goes something like this. So, so the, the, the commission gave us, like I said, a, a, a wide range of recommendations on how do we make equity a more permanent part of USDA? How do we increase accountability across the department? How do we improve the Office of Civil Rights? How do we improve access to land and capital? How do we increase diversity at the department so that we are more reflective of the American public that we're trying to serve? How do we improve subsidies and farmer participation in programs and support minority serving institutions? And there were over 15 recommendations specifically on how to improve rural development programs. But they made a pretty solid recommendation on heirs property and it said this, that in heirs property, when you have a resource out there and it's not clear who owns this, it's also not clear how a person can actually gain from improving that property. So the first step has to be to clear up the ownership so that people can make investments in it like their neighbors have been doing for years and make that property more valuable. So the equity commission said, let's look at some, maybe some non-loan options, maybe some grants or cooperative agreements with people that have expertise in this area that can improve land clear up the legal work, and help people draft estate plans to actually protect that property after it's been approved. Maybe we need to look at longer-term contracts, multi-year contracts, to be able to accomplish this. And maybe we need to uh, have designated funding for heirs' property. Because these have been underutilized and people have suffered, maybe we need designated funding to direct resources towards heirs' property because I can assure you that if the property has been underutilized, once you clear up the title, it's going to need some work. If it's a pasture, it's going to have trees and shrubs growing on it. If it's cropland, it's going to have underbrush. And if it's been underutilized, it probably doesn't have all the modern conveniences of the neighboring farms, like precision level land and irrigation and other things that are required to actually cash flow a farming operation today. Okay. So that's what the Equity Commission is saying. The other thing that that I like, and 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 I had the opportunity. Mr. Polk is here. Uh, Mr. Mitchell was featured in Gaining Ground. I need to be transparent with you. In 2020, I had just retired from Monsanto Company Bayer, and I was executive director of the National Black Growers Council. And I remember sitting in my desk when I got the call from a good friend of mine at John Deere, and he said, "Dwayne, um, I got one for you." I said, "Denver, what's what's up?" He said. We want to do something around heirs property. I said, really? John Deere? What's up with that? Because you 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 know, you 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 there's not a direct profit line to John Deere for clearing up heirs property, right? But he said it's the right thing to do. And I was in from day one. So what I'm getting at is you'll see this documentary and and, and I love it. Um I was I was with John Deere as they were developing and, and providing some feedback as they were developing the leap coalition. So I, have to, I have to give them kudos, but I also have to give kudos to the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, Federation of Southern Co-ops, Center for Heirs Property, and the National Black Growers Council for working with them to bring this into existence, to provide corporate investments, to go along with the things that we're doing in the government to address this issue, and finally, provide some meaningful resources that will help cure it. but we have bigger problems. We have other issues. And I know this because I've been there. When you've been left out for so long, you tend to operate from a platform of distrust. And here's what's gonna be required, I think. When you don't trust the situation, you haven't seen it work for you. I can't think that I'm gonna be able to go into a group of a family thank you, of, of, of heirs property owners and say, look, this is the way this program works. Sign up. We got you covered. Like, no, you with the government. Y'all got me before, you know? So really what we've got to focus on is demonstrations. 
showing people what we're talking about, providing positive examples to showcase what can be done when we get legal people working with agronomists and, and land improvement people to bring these things into existence so that other people can see these benefits and get convinced to the point that they'll go back to their ass property. Clear title, it has to be first because if you improve the land before you clear title, you're gonna have some problems because then it becomes a valuable resource that's subject to all this trickery that you've been hearing about today and you'll hear about more tomorrow. But we've got to unlock those benefits, clear title, make the improvements and get this back into working lands that will benefit the communities that we've left behind. So Mr. Mitchell, the planners of this conference, I wanna thank you for your unwavering dedication to this issue, to getting the media and other people involved to the point that we will be compelled to take action. And I look forward to enjoying the ride with you. I'll open up for questions. Thank you, sir. When you ask a question, please state your name and where you are coming from. My name is Thomas Mitchell. I'm a <laughs> law professor at Boston College <laughs> with some friends outside of the legal professoriate. Uh, very fortunate. So I just wanted to, I don't know, is Latrice here? Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to say, you know, I've been fortunate to meet a lot of really good people, both in academia and outside. And so when I was putting together, you know, my portion of the conference, you can't have an heirs property conference without dealing with agriculture and having somebody from the USDA. So one of the folks I've gotten to know was Latrice um, a few years ago. So she was my go-to. So I said, Latrice, I need some help. Can you identify one or two people from USDA who could you know, be a speaker on a panel. And she's like, I got your back. Um, three days later, she emails me again. And she says, I think we can get Dr. Goldman. I was like, in what world is Dr. Goldman going to come to a conference at Boston College? Um, and then three days later, she confirmed Dwayne's coming. Um, so I just wanted to, to give you a shout out for, you know, working on uh, our behalf. And then she unlocked, she said, I think I know some people at HUD and FEMA. Uh, and then she made that happen too. So I want to, I just want to thank you for that. Um, the question I have for you, uh, Doc, is um, you talked a little bit about the Equity Commission. So can you just share a little bit about where they are now? And, you know, what happens with their recommendations? Are they just purely advisory or are they, are, are they being acted upon? Great question. And, and, and just so we're all familiar, the Equity Commission um, is an is a external panel of experts that were charged with providing the secretary, my boss, with a set of actionable recommendations that help make equity a more permanent part of USDA as we go forward. And if we do this right, it should span administrations. So when this administration is no longer in power, if we embed this deeply enough, we incorporate it into the fabric of the department, and we get people to resources that they refuse to give up, that's the way we think we can embed equity. But, but the commission, um, again, you asked where we are now. So February, 2023, they released a set of like 32 interim recommendations. Over the last year, they worked with the department, with their stakeholders, to finalize those recommendations. They ended up with 66 recommendations, each of which has about five sub-recommendations. So you're looking at about 300 action items, if you would call it, that need to be prioritized, implemented. And here's the other part of it. Some of them won't be necessarily easy. Secretary has authority to do some of them. In fact, he's already implemented some, appointing people to uh, county committees and the heirs property relending program, Linda Cronin, you'll hear from tomorrow, um, uh, working with Latrice on that one. So, so a lot of these things we're already doing, but there are some of them in there that will require legislative change. And to the extent that we can, because we, you know, USA doesn't write the farm bill, but we do get asked for technical assistance. So we'll provide that technical assistance to Congress 
to the Senate to say, this is important to equity. And that's an important part of this work. Next week will be the first of several of what we call in regional equity convenings. And they're scattered around the country to focus on different things. Detroit will be next week with folks on urban agriculture because we think that that's gonna be an important part of it. And there will be, sir, some implications for heirs property in urban ag. As you, you, you mentioned Latrice Hill, uh, the, the White House, the Biden administration is already looking at disaster response and how heirs property impacts disaster response. After Hurricane Katrina, I was, I was uh, excited to hear about the uh, Homestead Act being applied to residences like that. Because after Katrina, there were people that couldn't even get assistance from FEMA because they didn't have clear title to the house that had just recently been destroyed. So that's an important part of this. So as we're canvassing the country trying to do this, I think it's going to be important that we continue to, one, work, work with heirs property because it touches uh, our, our customers in a lot of different ways, but also uh, open up to other things that need to be done in order to further embed equity into this into this process. So thanks for the question. Mr. L.A. and I, I saw him first, sir. I think you got one online. Let, let me get him and then. Okay, he's got the mic. Well, let's get this one and then we'll come to you. That, okay. I think Sam. I'll, I'll try and be quick. By, by the way, we've had consistently over 120 people online. So this is a, a question from one of them. Can the USDA play a role in supporting or requiring farmers to engage in estate planning in ways that will avoid or remedy heirs' property crises? Can USDA play a role in requiring? Okay. I, I don't think a stick is going to work here. I think we have to figure out a carrot. So yes, it, I think it absolutely has to be a part of the process. But when you operate from that position of distrust and you start talking about requirements, I get a little nervous. But I think what we can do and should do and are doing and have to continue to do is to show people what can happen when, we, when you start talking about heirs property. And here's, here's a story I'll share with you. I was at a meeting, this was a month or two ago, and it was me and maybe one or two other black folk in the room. Now that happens a lot, right? I'm just trying to keep it honest here, right? And so some questions came up in my small circle about heirs property. What is heirs property? And these are people from Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado. And they were like, we hear about it, but fundamentally we don't understand what it is. And I said, okay, let's just say that I'll pick on Mr. Mitchell. He's a good friend of mine. Let's just say that we're brothers, right? We're the only two in the family. Mom and dad pass on, and they leave us a dollar. That's all they got. And no will, no nothing. So we take that dollar, tear it in half. Thomas gets his half. I get my half. Does he have 50 cent? Do I have 50 cent? No. I have 50% interest in a dollar that's no good until I get with my brother Thomas and tape that back together, right? That's heirs property. Now let's just say that I have two kids, which I do, and I pass on. Do my kids have a quarter each? No. They have 25% interest in that dollar that's no good until they tape theirs together and get with Thomas and put it back with him. And when you look at it multiple generations, those are the things. And so when you start putting requirements around how we fix that, I think people are going to get a little nervous because why are you requiring this? You've already taken land from us before. I think what we've got to do is show folk how we can put those dollars back together and make sure that the family has all the resources that they need to hold on to that dollar. Because if that dollar goes into a trust and someone tears it up, all they have is a piece of the trust. The land itself is protected, as I understand it. And so we've got to we've got to demonstrate those kind of things in a very practical way, so that people will be encouraged to come and fix their heirs' property issues after they see the things that can be done once those issues are cleared up. Thank you, Samantha, uh, Dr. Goldman, um, Rodney Benson from Redondo Beach, California. Question: The USDA uh, agriculture organization you represent has a budget of funds that might be available to heirs property owners once title is established and cleared. Am I correct so far? 
I'm going to correct you, but go ahead. Well, let me clarify that part of it because we have several programs and I've used them, right? So, so if I want to uh, improve my, if I want to do land level and improve my land, I have to show control of land. I have to show that either by ownership or by a valid deed with the owner of record, right? So if I have a lease with the owner and I have a, a sufficient time on a contract, I can show that lease and actually unlock the benefits and I might can get 75, 90% cost share on a benefit that costs thousand dollars an acre. So, so it's, it's a big deal. But if I don't have and can't demonstrate clear ownership, I can't, I can't, I can't unlock those benefits. And that's what I mean by clearing up the title so that people can access those benefits and increase the value of their operations. Right. So my point is clear ownership is tantamount to applying for any of your plans to help people with their property. So that when I go back and talk to my people, cause we have heirs from 25 to 50 deep, what carrot as far as an amount that might be available in your budget that we could tap into to help our property if we get our title squared away? Are we talking about $100,000? Are we talking about $5 million? How much are we talking about? It depends. If it's a lot in a supermarket that is worth a whole bunch of money, it could be one thing. If it's an acre of farmland, it could be a different one. If it's a house, it could be a different one. 170 acres of agricultural farmland in the middle of Texas. Is it irrigated? Is it dry land? Is it, is it improved? So, so it, it just depends. What I'm getting at, sir, is I think the first thing, and, and, and perhaps these conversations can be a little more impactful if we have a complete conversation. Okay. Because if you go in and say, we need to clear title to the land, it's like, yeah, maybe. But if you go in and you say, once we clear title to the land, we can get these cost share improvements that could double the amount of rent that we're getting per acre. And you, and you roll that out. And you say, in addition to that, once we get show clear title to the land, we can work with the National Resource Conservation Service or NRCS, you know, used to be called Soil Conservation. But we can work with them to put together a conservation plan that would do it. And guess what? This administration has invested in climate smart practices that could be put on this land and we can generate additional income off establishing those practices. But all of those things require clear title to the land. So, so what we've got to do, sir, is I, I think we've got to have a more integrated discussion about what can happen when we do that. Because on the other side of the fence, where they do have clear title, they're probably already doing that. They're probably already getting those benefits. They've probably already gotten those cost share opportunities. It's just that on this side of the track, we, got, we hadn't quite figured out how to do it yet. So I, I think that's the conversation that we need to do. I think our our heirs property relending program, I think the, the 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 private investments, I think we've got a shift to showing demonstrations that can entice that will entice people to actually kind of lean in and see these things through so that you know the land will capture the kind of value that it has the potential to do. Thank you for your answers. This will be our last question for the panel. I'll be around t tomorrow. I'm not running off. So I, I, if, 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 if you're anxious and I, I shouldn't be that hard to find. So yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Natasha Moody. I'm with the Housing Assistance Council. Uh, Dr. Goldman, thank you for your comments. It's great to hear about the Equity Commission and these innovations. Um, I was wondering, so we've seen with the Housing Assistance Council how USDA has been instrumental in supporting rural residents who do not have access to other housing um, support with the 502, 504, 515 programs and um, all the innovations and with the equity plan, the recommendations put forth are directed towards agricultural land, which is under, you know, needed, obviously, you know, of course. I was wondering if there were thoughts around expanding some of those considerations to like the 502 or 504 programs or communities that rely heavily on that type of funding to access housing. Yeah, th there are, thank you. There, there are some specific recommendations and, and, and I should have said this earlier, www.usda.gov slash equity, and you can access, it's a very public document. You can access that report. It identifies the people that are there. And so I, I think 
yeah, all of this, I, I see all this as being related. So whether you're talking about a 502 or 504 housing program, you're still going to have to document, you know, clear title to the land, right? So, so regardless of what the benefit is out there, I think the heirs property issue remains important. But to follow up just like I did with Rodney, it, it, it's the same thing. We've got to talk about this thing more completely, more full circle, so that people will be incentivized to go ahead and do what's needed to do to clear the title and then make the improvements. And I keep saying it in that order because as, as, a, as a kid growing up in the rural South, and I saw this with, 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 with folks, the, the, the word on the street was, if you want to lose your land, improve it. And that's when it gets taken away, right? So we really got to protect the land and then do the improvements. And it's important to do that because all these things that you're talking about, all these tricks and stuff, they get amped up. They get put on steroids when you improve your land. Yeah. We actually have one more bonus question. I'll be really quick. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kim Addy. I'm with Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative. And this conversation just made me curious, uh, um, and this question is specific to the Equity Commission in and of itself. Um, I think with the rollback of affirmative action, um, given uh, what will come out of this Equity Commission in terms of recommendations, um, my assumption that is you all are not just thinking about geography, but who is um, uh, substantially um, impacted by heirs property, like, what are conversations that you all are having? And does this um, rollback impact some of the recommendations that are coming out of that committee? <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, the rollback was a inconvenient wake up call, I'll say. But hang on, we've been here before. There was, was a Supreme Court decision in 1954 that impacted me very fundamentally. And hell, remember the Titans was 1971? And the integration thing didn't happen for 17 years? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that to be tongue in cheek. But what I will say is, for me, it was kind of a wake up call. And, and here's some important things. When, when you use data, I'm gonna, I told you, I'm an agronomist by training. When you use data uh, to state the problem, and have a very open discussion, you also get to use that same data to come up with solutions. And so if heirs property is disproportionately a problem in the black community and the brown community, it says that we probably need to pay, pay special attention to the black and brown community. That's not playing favorites. It's using data to make, it's using data-driven uh, data-driven problems to come up with data-driven solutions. And I don't, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, so, and I think we've got to, we've got to continue to, so we've got to continue to, to, to push back. It, it's a little, it's a little disingenuous to come to a point in time where you say, okay, everything is fine now. We're all equitable, but yet we have strong indicators that we have not achieved equity yet. And so I, I think we'll have to continue to work with that. So I think we're just going to close this. So I just wanted to say two things before we close. Um, so one, just to put a fine point, when I say how lucky we are to have Dr. Goldman, um, you know, he's a big deal. He's a direct report to the Secretary of Agriculture. And because he's a big deal, I don't try to call him or reach out to him every week. But the half the time I have reached out to him, I hear from his aide, oh, he's over at the White House. Um, he's not available right now. The... Um, and he's been doing great stuff uh, since he's uh, been in this inaugural role. So I thought your presentation was awesome. I, I only got a little bone to pick with you. There was some part in your, your presentation that you said something like, say hypothetically, Thomas and I are brothers. I thought we were brothers. <laughs> when I got downgraded. <laughs> All right, man. all right, thank you. Thanks for the correction. My name is John Cooper. I will be your 
moderator for this session. We're good. Uh, I am a professor of the practice at Texas A&M University in the College of Architecture in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Urban Planning. Uh, like PJ from the film, I am the fifth of seven generations of a family that still holds on to uh, 120 acres of land in Northeast Texas, Dr. Goldman. So about 50 miles south of Texarkana. Right? Yeah, <laughs> right. I figured you would know what that is. Uh, and because we only have like 30 minutes for this, I'm not going to take a whole lot of time with introductions. I'll do a quick round of introductions and then we will uh, uh, go right into the questions. Uh, let's see. So, yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see, we'll see how it's going. Uh, uh, Professor Mitchell was saying if, if, it, if it gets good, we can stay around a little longer. <laughs> so, I suspect it will, but I didn't want to make any promises. All right. So our first uh, speaker is uh, our director, Eternal Polk. Uh, Eternal is, uh, it says it Midwest Rays. Yes. Brooklyn culture, season, and currently uh, marinating in, in Charlotte. That's a good way to say it. Uh, let's see, his work has appeared on various outlets, including HBO, ESPN, BHBT, VH1, MTV, Fox, the NFL Network, TBS, and HGTV. Uh, and he's received a lot of awards, which we've already talked about uh, already. Too many to name, but uh, so glad you're able to be here with us. Then we have uh, Tharlin Fox who is uh, leading the uh, Legislation Education Advocacy Production Systems Program, the LEAP program out of John Deere. Uh, Darlin's leadership uh, in her role, she collaborates closely, as the film said, with uh, esteemed organizations such as the National Black Growers Council and the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, and together they work to dismantle barriers created by heirs' property uh, and provide crucial resources to enhance the lives and livelihoods of black farmers. Uh, across the country. And, and then we have uh, Dr. Goldman, who you met earlier. Uh, and last but not least, some some guy named Thomas Mitchell that uh, I, feel, I feel like we should all know who Thomas is. Actually, we should have had a competition, Thomas, that, to decide uh, not who knows you, but who's know, known you the longest, right? I think uh, you, you've told a lot of stories here about uh, your relationships with people. Actually, I have one. I should I should tell this story. Is it something that I'm not going to be embarrassed? No, you're not going to be embarrassed. <laughs> I first met Thomas in 2001, about 2001, and we were in North Carolina at the North Carolina Environmental Justice Conference. Uh, he was giving a presentation, and I was there. I think by then he was a you were a professor already at Wisconsin. Oh. Yeah, Angela still a long time ago. Where's Angela? Uh, and I was a doctoral student at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill doing my dissertation work on the extent to which marginalized and disenfranchised populations are accounted for uh, in disaster plans. And I almost didn't show up because my firstborn daughter, Layla, was only a couple days old, but uh, my in-laws showed up from Texas to, to help out. And so I was able to go to the conference. And I remember, uh, I'll never forget, listening to him talk about these, these issues. And it stuck with me because Dr. Goldman uh, in 2001, I can remember from 2006 when I was working with the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management trying to help families get access to disaster relief after Hurricane Frank, right? Uh, and by the time Hurricane Katrina happened, we still hadn't figured out a way to deal with those issues. That was 10 years later. And now, almost 10 years after Hurricane Katrina, there's still a lot of room for improvement with regard to emergency management disasters. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to be at a conference in North Carolina on Monday for two days just talking about equity and disaster recovery, but I digress. I don't want to go there. I just want to say that uh, I thank you for your dedication, your diligence, and, and yes, your sleep deprivation, you know. Um, even though it's 10 years after Hurricane Katrina and we still got a lot of room for improvement, I've never given up hope because I knew Professor Mitchell was on it, right? And so the work, uh, you, you've transformed the, the lives and, and legacies of many. I appreciate you. Yeah, so uh, that's it. I, I got a first question for Eternal. Okay, are you ready? And so I'm gonna ask a question to each of the panelists and then we'll, we'll turn it over to um, 
the audience for questions. So my first question for you is, so if, if you had a chance to release a director's cut or maybe do a second version of, of this, what, what, what would you include that's not in this version? How would you tell the stories differently or, or how would you do it? We've already talked about this. It would be the Thomas Mitchell story where he finds out that mar lago is heir's property and he launches he launches this um, case to get it out of the hands of Donald Trump and return it to his right ball. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, we do have a six hour cut of this film, believe it or not. Um, what, what I would do is I think um, whenever you, you do a project like this, um, the issue is central to the conversation always. But I, what I personally find fascinating is the journey of each individual in the film and how they became a part of, and, and it got pulled into the, um, to the orbit of the issue. Like um, Shirley Sherrod, her story in particular is so interesting because what we didn't show in here or say in here was that she did not want to meet a man from the South because she didn't want to marry a man from the South. That was her whole thing because she didn't want to be in the South. And she was on the first thing, you know, leaving the South when it was time to go to college. If not for her father's death, she wouldn't be, she wouldn't have taken up that role in life that she had, had not, would have not met Charles Sherrod, new communities, we don't know. So it's almost like fate that kind of pulled her into that. And then you think about all of the ripple effect, if she had not, you know, been uh, coming back to the South. And so even um, uh, Thomas Award Mitchell here, <laughs> Sorry, inside joke. Um, even his story and how he came to um, be a part of this is an inter interesting um, story about family and discovery and and his um, what I want to call his stick to in the face of I'm telling you the the backstory for his film right now. Mm -hmm. His stick to itiveness yeah. and sti staying with a um, an area of law that was, you know, thought to be fringe, not important, and wouldn't ultimately lift him in his field and in his career. And now we see this, and I think about um, a a young uh, Thomas Mitchell in a library by himself, trying to take on this this issue that would affect millions of people billions of dollars and everyone telling him nah get out of here kid and so those stories are interesting to me and if i had a director's cut i, I would have spent more time with each of the people and saw how and we show how their lives all got to this point where they intersected mm -hmm. because if the and last thing i'll say in the in the scope of that the eli family they were able to keep their land because of the work that he did. And when we had our very first premiere, they were able to meet. And I really, I was really looking forward to that because sometimes the work you do, you don't, all the people that you benefit are kind of anonymous mm -hmm. and you don't always get to cross paths with the people that you help. And so that meeting was really one of my favorite moments, like after the film was when they were able to meet. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and, and, and I wish I could have given you money back then. Because <laughs> I saw something that you, I still have the copy of that manuscript that you handed out that day that I need you to autograph. Okay. <laughs> uh, Darlene, quick question for you. So yes. uh, I watched a couple of other videos uh, about this film on, on YouTube. And I encourage other people to go, go see those because, again, we won't have a lot of time to get into a, a lot of topics unless it starts to go well. And, and Thomas gives us some, some grace and mercy here. But one of the things I think I heard in, in one of the other panels is that, yes, a large part of the work that you're doing 
the urgency, the front part of it, the first phase of it is helping families get legal titles of land. But you got an eye on the long term, right? It's it's what happens once you get legal titles. What's next? You got the land. Now what? Right. And so question for you is what are some of the promising strategies that you see as opportunities for families once they get clear titles of land? Is it crop farming like uh, PJ? Is it, you know, solar or some, some other? What were the opportunities you see? So I have to contextualize all of this in this entire work um, that has been done and done to date. And so this this documentary and this film was, was born from the LEAP Coalition. And so the, the LEAP Coalition, LEAP Organization, is the organization that I run at John Deere. So I'd be remiss not, not saying that so that the audience understands, you know, how this film came to be. And so the, the, the LEAP Coalition um, is, is actually a, a, a trinity of sorts between John Deere, Thurgood Marshall College Fund, and the National Black Growers Council, of which Mr. Goldman was the executive director. And so I, I have to say this, if, if you would give me just a, a, a minute. The very first phone call, and, and, and Dr. Goldman probably won't remember this, was with P.J. Haney that I had with you. I was with P.J. Haney and Dr. Goldman. And one of the things that they told me was that you have to protect the acres. Tharlin, that's what you have to do is protect the acres. And that was in, I think, either the end of 2020, because we formed this, and I was appointed to this role in October of 2020, and then I met you all. And from that day to the day, that is still in my strategy. And whenever I meet in front of folks, protect the acres is still part of the strategy of the LEAP Coalition. So I had to say that. Mr. Goldman, because I still lead with that, that conversation that we had. And so th this, this documentary was born from that work, and that's exactly how I met Denise Green from the Al Roker team when we talked through how we would represent and what we would do in order to bring awareness to this important topic of heirs' property. We finally landed on the film, and so one of the things is that we don't want to lose sight of the families. This is a beautifully crafted film, but we never want to lose sight that there are families behind this film. There are families that have lost property in the midst of losing property, and they need the assistance. And so the LEAP Coalition, their primary mission is to improve the livelihood of Black farmers, families and landowners and help them clear title to the land. And so your question is, you know, how, what's the strategy? And so as we talk through in the strategy, what I did not want to happen is that we help folks clear title to the land and then we wave them off. Help them clear title to the land and say, we say the job is done. But what we want to do is make sure that they're productive, make sure that they have a legacy to pass on to the next generation, make sure that we help them in terms of securing generational wealth. And the way that we do that is how we, we've incorporated the National Black Growers Council, that our other partners that are part of our strategy, making sure that there's a clear strategy to make sure that they are productive. If that is forestry, as you mentioned, solar, some of our, our, our farmers are engaged in, soldier, um, um, in, in solar. So we make sure that we do that. Um, all of these things are part of the plan for families. All of the families don't want a farm. So they may want to lease the, 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 the um, farm. They may want to rent it. So there is a strategy in place. There are folks that are smart, smarter than me, that know exactly what needs to be done so that these families have an income strategy for the rest of their lives and beyond to assist their families. So that's what we wanted to make sure that you clear a title, but making sure that these families are productive. And when we made this film, we wanted to make sure that we bring awareness to a topic, something that a brand had not done when it comes to heirs' property, but more than that, a call to action. So families, uh, so the uh, smart people that are in the room, practitioners, all of these folks can come together and decide how we can help these families. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goldman, I, I want to come back to you. Uh, my, my next question is for Professor Mitchell. So, uh, Thomas, you, you've been at this a long time. I've been very successful, accomplished a lot, changed a lot of lives. 
Uh, now I want to uh, hear a little bit more about uh, what's on your radar. So we, we talked about the fact that we still don't know what the full extent of the problem is, right? Earlier you talked about how there is a kind of an excess demand for uh, folks who specialize in, in property law, the, the people who are coming up, the cadre, the, 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 the Calvary that's coming. Uh, and then we, we've also talked about how there are a lot of uh, judges and, uh, and developers who don't know the law, right? And, and even the ones who know the law, uh, sometimes they don't respect it, right? And there's no, there's been no consequence for not respecting the law. So, so, so what's keeping you up at night these days? You know, I often think about, um, I mean, first of all, the blessings of my work in terms of just the incredible jewels of people I've met along the way. Um, I mean, even when I look around this room, I, you know, I've just been so fortunate to work with a subset of, uh, of you. I just wanted to say that, you know, first of all, because I know folks are, you know, being very generous with their accolades and, and their, their kind words. But to me, it's, um, it's been a real joy um, for that. You know, so I think about, you know, my, uh, you know, the legislative success. And, you know, I think what I was trying to do, in addition to these particular states and changing the law in these particular states, is try to, you know, puncture or overcome a mindset that all the explanations were structural and that nothing could be done. And so, you know, my, one of my biggest hopes was to give people a sense of agency that they could actually take action and that that action could lead to positive outcomes. And that just wasn't the state of affairs when I started. It was like, it's futile, right? And so what I often say is just in terms of the, um, the legislative wins is, well, first of all, it's not just about, you know, notches on the belt, like is the statute actually helping people? And I know that there's been some research done um, that's showing that it's actually um, stemming or limiting the number of these abusive partition actions and it's helping folks uh, preserve generational wealth. But, you know, what I, what I usually say is that there's no greater fan of the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act than Thomas Mitchell. There's nobody who understands its limitations and that it's not a silver bullet more than Thomas Mitchell. And so I just, what I hope is that by demonstrating that you can take action and you can work collectively with others in a very strategic way, burn some midnight oil, that you can advance the ball. And that hopefully that, that um, kind of gets rid of this sense of hopelessness because there's many other reforms and policies that need to be kind of put in place. So I'll just tell you, um, you know, we've known each other a long time. We've had different chapters in that. We had the Texas A&M chapter. John Cooper's at um, Texas A&M. That's where I came from most recently. Um, is that, you know, to take it more to scale, like in my work, instead of kind of working as a lone wolf, try to build, you know, I have this initiative on land, housing, and property rights, and then try to grow it perhaps into a center so that there could be teams of people who are working on much needed research that can inform policy. There could be people working on policy. There could be students trained. So as you, rec you know, referenced that there would be another a cadre um, of folks and that we could do like, um, you know, community engagement work at a much higher level. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Goldman, what's, what's keeping you up at night? I, I, Maybe a presidential election, or I don't know what. <laughs> what what's going to happen if you know, there's changes afoot? Um, th that's a great question. I, I would encourage people to vote. It, it's going to be it's going to be real important uh, in November, um, and that's all I'll say about that one. Um, but really, I, I think often about the urgency in doing this because every time we sleep late, every time we miss an opportunity, we, Professor Mitchell, we lose a little more. People don't get it. And, and there's an urgency to this. 
we have some tremendous resources at the department right now. But they came because President Biden put a couple of priorities in this administration that were not around before. Equity. Uh, climate change. And, and these are important, addressing disparities. Folks, if, if this were a, you know, it's March Madness, you know, you, you play two halves football, you play four quarters. This is the fourth quarter of this administration. And I think we, we have far too many people that haven't gotten to yes, in this case on heirs' property. And, and I've, I've had, had the opportunity to talk to a lot of you here at this conference. We, we've got to get people to yes so that these demonstrations and improvements behind all the great work that's going on will start to speak for themselves and empower people to the point that the fact that people have improved their clear title, thank you, clear title, improved their property, transition from a liability where you're trying to pay taxes just to hang on a little bit to an asset that's actually reproducing generational wealth. When you get enough people in that category, this thing starts to be self-sustaining. And I think there's an urgency with which we have to operate that gets us to this self-sustainability. Thank you for that. You know, as I listen to you and Thomas, Thomas talked about agency and you talk about, well, all of you kind of talking about and the, the, the value of, of this work. I'm, I'm afraid, I think, of losing the memory, right? Thank you, Eternal, for, for documenting the stories about the, the, the families and, and the work. I can remember growing up on my family's farm, I and mean, it was towards the tail end. My uncle rode a horse. My great uncle, my grandfather's brother, rode a horse. We had hogs and cattle, right? Uh, we hauled pulp wood in a little one-ton truck. I don't remember that, but I was, I'm the last generation, right? I'm the oldest grandchild uh, in the grand generation. None of my cousins remember that. Right? They don't remember uh, harvesting sweet potatoes and you know, just being able to go out to the potato house. I, 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 so I fear losing that memory, but, I, but I, I think, I believe, I have hope, Professor Mitchell, that we can, we can claim, reclaim it and keep it going. So uh, with that, thanks again to, to y'all. Let, let's uh, turn it over to the audience for questions. And uh, you got instructions, Samantha? Yes. If you can please state your name and where you are coming from, that would be greatly appreciated. Hi, um, I'm Octavia Howell from Pew Charitable Trust in Philly. Um, one of the values that I heard pretty clearly in the, the video there is that the the, the the family members wanted to leave property to their family, not to an individual. And coming from an urban context, when I think about clearing title, I think about getting the property into one person's name. It doesn't really sound like that's entirely what was happening in the documentary. So I'm curious to know, what is the, the mechanism for ownership that you all advocate, especially when you're thinking about maintaining a family property? I'll, um... I'll share with you, well, I'm nervous because you sit beside experts, you just gotta be careful, right? But but I'll share with you a perspective from a farmer agricultural standpoint that probably has significance to an urban setting. So the the most successful stories that I hear out of this are not necessarily to get a single owner, but it's to protect the property through a trust, through some legal mechanism that protects the property. Now, surely, if there is a member of the family that desires to be that single owner and everybody agrees to that, that could be a very effective strategy, right? But in a lot of cases, that may not be the most efficient way to protect the property. Because if you start talking about I'll take 40 acres of land. We talked about 40 acres in a muted broke point, 40 acres of land. Around me, that could be $5,000 an acre, $200,000. And it may not be feasible for one person to take on that kind of debt. If you're talking about 1,000 acres, it gets up to, you know, it, it can escalate pretty quickly. 
but if you if you protect that if you protect that land, put it in a trust, and let one person operate the land, and pay a fair rent to the family to the trust, and then the managers of that family get to say, well, we want to take now these rental income from this, and we can do scholarships. We might acquire more land. We might do all these kinds. Once you convert it into an asset, you have opportunities. The issue is when, un until you protect the property from a legal standpoint, you're vulnerable. Because any person that invests in that property, I mean, I got some worst case scenario, I got some crackheads in my family probably somewhere down the line. I mean, I'm third generation. If one of those people sell out, and they may be in California, New York, somewhere. And 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 Dr. Cooper, they have no intimate relationship with the land, so it doesn't mean anything to them because they they didn't go to the potato house, they didn't do this stuff, right? But if they sell out, they can let an outside person gain an interest to do some weird things around it. So so the first step is to protect the land, and then and then we can we, the family can decide what they want to do with the resources. I would say th the same thing for an urban home that the grandmother left or dad or mom or someone, you know, if you protect the, the property and lease it out and then the family can create a structure, a management structure to decide what they want to do with the profits from it, pay the taxes, keep it up, do this kind of thing. And it becomes more of a business decision or I see the real opportunity is whether we're talking about farmland, large tracts of land or a single lot or house or whatever is to protect it, convert it, and then make responsible decisions about how you invest the income that's generated from that. Yeah, so uh, let me just add to that, is that the when we're looking at this will making and estate planning gap that leads to air pro, it's severe. So I'll just, uh, I was gonna say this tomorrow, but I'll, let me just, I'll say it now. So I mentioned that one of the least known racial gaps is this racial will making and estate planning gap. So, I'll, there's one study I'm very well respected study of these three economists, including one at WashU in St. Louis that I know. And in their study, they showed that um, the average in terms of uh, of white adults was that 65% of white adults made a will. For African Americans, it was 22 or 23%. That's a 40% gap. Now, what's true is in in the study, not surprisingly, for every racial and ethnic group those with the most education made wills at the highest rate and those with the least education made wills at the lowest rate that's not like shocking but you know for white americans so the in the study those with the most education had a college degree and for white americans with a college degree it was like some like 83 percent of folks had a will or a state plan it was true that for african americans with a college degree they had the highest will making rate for black people, but it was 32%. So I'm at a stage that even with the most educated, it's a massive problem. So it gets a little bit fine tuned. Like, let, let's start with, let's address that issue, right? Um, and then I'm, I'm not, I don't, I think Dr. Goldman was saying this, right? So I'm not like um, somebody who says it's got to be, you got to, then get a will and it's got to look like this or a state plan, is that you educate people, you educate people about the negative consequences of not having, and then you, like the best attorney is going to show, well, what are your values as a, as a family? And here's your range of options. So at least people are making educated choices about how they're going to structure their ownership to the greatest benefit of the family. To that point, one of the great organizations that partners with the LEAP organization, and Brianna happens to be in the audience, is these, you know, you didn't know I was going to call you out, did you? <laughs> is the Centers for Heirs Property Preservation. And part of that strategy is the prevent portion of that and is the estate planning. And in addition to that, one of the things that, you know, the, the LEAP coalition does and does very well is that it partners with HBCUs. And with HBCUs, it, it does, we have, 
uh, law interns that um, intern with the Centers for Ears Property as well as the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And part of that strategy, their boots on the ground, working directly with families, assisting them with wills clinics, helping them with that strategy, with the state planning, because that is the critical piece of the journey. And if you can prevent that, if you can help families with the state plannings, with wills, with trust, you can prevent, you know, the hemorrhaging that takes place when it comes to heirs property. Another question from the audience? It's one. Hello, my name is Nefertiti Jackman, and it's been a great day, uh, a long day. I'm from the city of Austin, uh, working in displacement prevention. Um, I have also worked in churches where Blacks refuse to have burial plans. And you see this where there's no money for a burial. Um, I've been around my grandparents. They've done no estate planning. And there, there seems to be something, and I'm trying to understand what is, I don't know if it's fear or what. We heard about the many people who left their land as a result of intimidation. Something is going on that I'm trying to see if we're missing. What are we missing? What is the fear? What is the apprehension? Even if we're talking about educated people, and I know I'm guilty. We're uh, not we going to solve that in this panel discussion. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, oh, well, uh, well, you can no, just give me a little bit so I can understand because I can't figure out what are we missing that we're not taking those steps to deal with and even address death or something. And I don't know what that thing is. That's all. Thank you. Uh, it's Nefertiti, right? I think we talked earlier. Have you ever been in a situation? where you don't know what you don't know, but you know something is not right. I, I think that's the thing with with heirs property. People know, and, and I said this earlier, I'll repeat, but pe people know that when, when they go into the system, whether it's the court system or USDA or the local banks or whatever, when they go into the system owning land and they come back out and the ownership of their land is jeopardized, it's like, whoa, I don't want to do that again. Right. Um, and so the fact that people have not developed a real ownership mentality, I, I think perhaps could be a problem. Right. And the fact that they haven't figured out how to get to yes to protect it is another problem. So I, I think a lot of the apprehension that we see is is fear of losing a little bit that you have. And then there's another factor that goes in now. I'm third generation, right? Um, my kids had the opportunity to spend a little time on the farm. I didn't farm full time. But as people get further and further removed from having that positive association with agriculture, the land doesn't have as much meaning anymore. And so when you have this combination of no intimate connection with the land, with the asset, and fear of the system, I think it leads you down this path towards apathy that doesn't work well. But again, we come back to solutions, right? And I think, you know, once you can make that conversion and, and, and turn these perceived liabilities into assets, I, I'm convinced that that problem will start to take care of itself. But, but that that has a lot to do with it, I think. I also think that we have, um, and we'll have this addressed tomorrow. I mean, unfortunately, we live in a country that is hyper segregated. We have um, a, a legal profession where different types of practice of law, it's not well represented among all groups, including black attorneys. Um, and, you know, it's 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 we have an underrepresentation of black attorneys generally. So we're about thirteen and a half percent of the population, five percent of attorneys, um, and that you know even before the Supreme Court overturned affirmative action, we had been stuck at five percent for decades. But among that five percent, 
the number of black attorneys who practice in areas that implicate wealth building and preservation is shockingly small. So I'll give you an example. You know, I um, co-edited and was a contributor for this book for the American Bar Association on heirs property and the Uniform Act. I interviewed an attorney in Portland, Oregon, black attorney who does estate planning. And she shared with me that in the entire state of Oregon, there are only five black attorneys that have any significant estate planning practice, which sounds shocking, right? I moved to Boston to join Boston College. One of my colleagues is a trust and estate expert, Ray Madoff. I was talking to Ray and about this. And I said, I mentioned just what I told you about out in Oregon. She's like, unfortunately, what you just said, we could apply that to Massachusetts too. It's not in Oregon or Massachusetts. Uh, so to the extent that we live in this segregated society, unfortunately, and you have average black Americans in their encounters with lawyers, they're not encountering a lot of black estate planning lawyers. They're not accounting black lawyers who do tax. Um, and so I think that there isn't an initiative and this is nascent, um, and you're going to hear about this tomorrow. I see Terry Franklin from Los Angeles, who's uh, a you know outstanding trust and estate attorney, and he's working on an initiative to try to encourage more uh, you know black law students to consider being estate planning attorneys. So you know I think that if we increase the supply and folks started running into these attorneys, that could be a piece of helping turn the tide a little bit. So I do want to add something because I, I think I know part of what you're getting at. There is a cultural conversation with black folks in death and having the conversation about death. I remember my mom sent me, this was when I was 20 something years old. She sent me a whole bunch of forms to fill out basically were like in the event of my death. And I was like, Ma, I don't want to talk about your death. And there is a, I think we didn't cover it in this film, but, and this is probably a film that's more um, an anthropological conversation, but there, but we do have to have that cultural conversation that makes it um, comfortable to even talk about a will and comfortable to talk about in the event of my death and my passing. And I don't know how we fix that, but I do know that it's present. And one of the things in the film I tried to do was not just stick with the numbers, but to talk to the cultural conversation. So we, we rarely talk about that, but that's a conversation that I'm having as a filmmaker, all the cultural sort of nuanced things that we, we speak about or not speak about amongst ourselves. I'm trying to have that conversation with the film, but that's one that we really didn't, you know, get into because as Thomas um, mentions, a big part of that is not just having access to people you trust to even talk about that stuff. Yeah, that's a good segue to a question I want to ask you. So I'm gonna come back to that. Professor uh, Mitchell, I'm, I'm looking around the room and it's been a long day. And I think people are sufficiently nourished, right? Maybe ready to go. So, but uh, so they let, let's let's and, and and if you guys have the energy, if you're willing to, maybe you can stick around a little, few more minutes. And if you didn't get your question answered, and they hang and they can't hang around, I'm not. Please do. Question for you, Eternal. Um, what's your next project? What what's what's the next thing? Oh, you know what? It, it's it's been interesting. You know, a lot of different things like coming my way and there's a I don't like to say it until it's actually happening but there is another documentary um that you know we're just waiting for the financing to come in but oddly enough because I want to do feature and episodic and I kept saying well you know I kind of this film kind of came to me because I kept telling Denise like oh that'd be a great film to direct and finally it came to me but I said I would like to do a feature film a narrative and I randomly got a script from someone that is very tangential to this conversation, but in a narrative space. And it was a film that was done 
by the person who was credited to be the black, the first black filmmaker, which is Oscar Michaud, and the print has been lost. So if we do happen to do this film, it will be the reimagining of a film that has been done by the first um, black filmmaker. So there are some things out there. You guys will be the second to know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got a tough act to follow. Uh, thank you for your vision and your creativity on this. Uh, thank you to our Lynn for the investments of the John Deere Foundation in this work. Thank you, Dr. Goldman, for your leadership uh, in the federal government. And Thomas, and thank God for you for you know just being Thomas, okay? Right? That's <laughs> what you were born to do. Thanks, sir. Yes.